Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Broadcasting to you live once again, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We got a beauty tonight. Gary Voorhees is here from UAPX, as well as the 2004 eyewitness to the USS Nimitz Tic Tac incident. We're going to get into a lot of UFO stuff with him tonight. Before we bring on Gary and his beard, which are two separate entities, two separate zip codes. Let's say hello to everyone in our audience tonight. Simon Wales with a gold medal in Australia tonight. Trucker Andrew is here. Hey, Andrew, hope you're supporting the convoy, my friend. I really hope you are. I know you are, my friend. Hey, race fan, bronze medal tonight. He gets dethroned. Jeffrey DeRuin, gorgeous cosmic floor. Mike Roberts, Don Hendrickson is here. She's looking lovely tonight and will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio for Don, to the left of the studio. Uh, give her some time. This is her first time signing autographs, so she may be a little intimidated. Hey, gorgeous Ozzy Ange. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Toe Tag, what's up, my friend? Good to see you. The gorgeous Nicole Perron is here. Thank you for coming on in. Todd Purden, Wes H., good to see you guys as we continue on with our roll call tonight. Lester Taylor is here. He'll be signing autographs. After the show as well, line up to the right of the studio, if you don't mind, to the right of the studio. Double Tim, good to see you. Thank you earlier on tonight, the Cat Chaser for kicking off the Super Chat. And tonight, Smithy with a Super Sticker. Thank you so much. The Super Chat and Super Stickers are a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you so, so much. Stunning Samantha, Apollo 11, good to see you both. Thanks for coming on in. And who else have we got here? Oh, look who it is. It's Doug Shelby, everyone. The Doug Shelby. Yep, he is back. Magna Zerum, good to have you here. The gorgeous and talented Kira. Nice to see you. Uh, Millennium, my man. What's happening? Richard Elmore. Bigfoot Rob. What's going on? And um, let's see here. Ozzy Ozzy. Oi, oi to you. Goth White. Good to have you here. Thomas DeLongeth. What is going on? And Project Blue Book, Mr. Lurks a lot. The gorgeous DM. She is a rebel from Red Deer. Yes, she is. Matthew Kennedy, good to see you. And we continue on with roll call. There's the stunning Sugar Britches. As we continue on here, uh, Matthew Kennedy. No, Merle was earlier. No Merling tonight, I don't think. The stunning Melissa Nicole has returned after a couple of nights off. Jeremy Jones, what's going on? Peppa H., good to see you. And who else is joining us? The stunning Avi May. Penman. What's happening, Penman? I hope you never run out of ink, my friend. The gorgeous Aunt Edna. Neil the Security. Sensational Sherry. Nice to see you all. And we continue on with our roll call. The gorgeous Marie S. from L.A. Enzo. What's happening? Gorgeous Arlene Adkinzel has returned. And uh, we better start the radio side of everything. Because that's kind of important for what we do here. Robert Rayom, thank you for joining us. And we really appreciate you being in our chat room for the first time. Hope you enjoy. Say hello to everybody. Get comfortable. Mennonite Abe, Bigfoot Anonymous, a.k.a. Connor Flynn. How you doing, buddy? How's the hair? Give us a hair update if you don't mind. We'd appreciate it. All right. We are caught up. 
Once again, the Super Chat is a wonderful way to support what we do on this show. It's Simon Whale's birthday, everyone. So let's give him a clap. There we go, Simon Wales, right there. All right. We're going to kick things off here momentarily. As you can see, there's our man. Uh, Gary, oh, you were frozen there for a second. I'm going to take you out and move you back in. I don't know why you're you, – we got a frozen picture of you, Gary. But uh, we're going to get going here in about 25 seconds. And uh, <clears throat> oh, still frozen. I mean, it's a good pose. I don't know what's causing that uh, freezing there. But uh, I don't know. Weird. Completely weird. I hope it's done on my end. We'll figure it out. Gorgeous L Pepper. There you go. Big J, what's happening? And uh, you know what? It's almost that time, everyone. Let's do us a favor here. We'll mute Gary here for a second. Horns up. Let's rock. mountains of central british columbia to you listening around the world this my friends is spaced out radio i am your host dave scott sitting in the captain's chair of sor headquarters we welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around north america digitally on talk stream live revolution radio and kpnl all of our archives are free go to youtube.com forward slash based out radio you will pay me the favor hit that subscribe button you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. We got a power show for you tonight, Gary Voorhees comes in to talk about Tic Tac research. Hour three, we got the Swamp Dweller. Fedora John is back with the UAP report. Shirky Poo's got the news and the thought of the Dave. So let's get going. Gary Voorhees is a back, has a background in mechanical engineering and worked as an electronic and RF technician in the United States Navy. He was a fire control man and Aegis computer CEC technician in the Navy, but it was the week of the 14th of November, 2004, that changed his life. He was an eyewitness with many others on the US, of the USS Nimitz Tic Tac events while on the USS Princeton. As a result, this experience... He has been interviewed for History Channel's Unidentified Inside America's UFO Investigation, and he is one of the co-founders of UAPX, trying to recreate the Tic Tac phenomena in the Pacific Ocean. We're glad to have him here. He's a good friend of this show. Gary Voorhees, welcome back to Space Out Radio. Hey, thanks for having me back, man. It's very good. I know you're tired. You know, you got a lot of <laughs> You're on the East Coast, and I'm just a wide-awake West Coaster here, so I'm going to make sure that I do not yawn tonight because you might be out like that, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Gary, first off, thank you for being a veteran and serving in the United States Navy. I know I'm up here in Canada, but we have a lot of our listeners in the United States and around the world, especially those veterans who tune us in on a nightly basis, so I just wanted to start off by saying thank you very much for your service uh, for all of us in North America. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, uh, vets from all classes and all parts of the world, uh, you know, I know uh, I've definitely, I've served and, and been over on some of the Canadian ships. They, uh, they have an excellent Navy and armed forces also. For you, did you ever think that after your Naval career that, your name would become synonymous with UFOs. Uh, not in the slightest. Uh, I mean, I honestly never saw thought that the the events from 2004 would ever see the light of day. Okay, so 
being the fact that you have this experience, and we're going to get into it a little bit deeper for people who may not be familiar with you, whether it's on our YouTube side or our podcast and, and radio side, for you being a part of this, what did you know about UFOs prior to this incident? Um, the X-Files. <laughs> I really, I wasn't really into too into like UFOs. I was more into sci-fi uh, things like, uh, you know, Isaac Asimov and uh, tech tech-based sci-fi. wasn't really into UFOs. No, so you didn't follow it at all outside of X Files. Not really, uh, unless it was a good story. Uh, you know, almost every one of my favorite science fiction shows would. Have, always eventually have a UFO episode, but, uh, prior to 2004, uh, it really wasn't a hobby or, uh, I really didn't think about it too much. All right. So for people who may not be familiar with the Tic Tac incident back in 2004, Let's go back because I think many of us have heard the story, whether it's on mainstream media or whether it's on the hundreds, if not now thousands of articles that have been written about this subject. But let's go back on the ship. Where were you when all of this started to occur? Uh, I was bouncing back and forth between my duty station uh, under, underneath Combat Central in the computer room, making sure all the mainframes are running properly to... Uh, up in Combat Central, where all the uh, displays that have all the Aegis data and all of the Spy One Bravo data on them, um, all those consoles were under my control, and you know I had to make sure maintain and operate all those consoles. So uh, then the OS technicians, like uh, Senior Chief Day, they were in charge of actually sitting in front of them and staring at their screens for their watches. Okay, I don't think you've ever been asked this before because, I mean, we look at you now, you're a mid-40s guy, much like mm -hmm. me and, and many others out there who are listening. How old were you at this time when, when you had this position? Well, uh, early 20s. Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is over almost 20 years ago. So here you are, uh, a, a young man. You've already served uh, overseas at that point, I believe. And then yes, went again, and you're now having to deal with something. How did you first learn about these anomalies in the sky on this training mission? So, so you leave San Diego with the fleet. Am I correct in saying that? And I apologize because I'm 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 not a real naval boat guy. There's sharks in there, and I'm not going in there. Okay, <laughs> so if I get some wrong please forgive me but you guys were stationed in san diego yeah. and then you guys went on a training uh mission with the fleet correct yeah so after two successful deployments in uh, operation iraqi freedom and enduring freedom uh we were doing workups to get ready for yet another <laughs> excursion out back out into the middle east uh so whenever you 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 whenever you come back you have to basically do qualifications all over again to make sure that everything is running good, that everybody's trained up. This is this would be a, a training session, uh, mostly for the pilots, but everybody has an associated job to do during these situations. So it's a training mission for everybody. Um, so we were going out to do what we call a CANX. It's where they, they go up and they kind of do flight missions and they, they pretend to fight each other and, uh, you know, engage each other in the air and for somebody like myself generally it's pretty boring uh you just make sure the computers are running and you stay out of everybody's way uh then uh i got up one morning and uh they're saying uh, you know hey we got uh, unknown tracks and you know we gotta take the system down at some point and make sure that we don't have clutter and, you know, just make sure that these things are real because you don't want to go to the captain and say, Hey, you know, we got some weird shit and, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's going to be a, a long day if it's, if it's not real or, or it ends up just being some type of, uh, of glitch or something like that. And, uh, so we, we verify everything. Then, uh, then we spend the next week on and off tracking these things. 
Um, and then at a certain point, we were about to do flight ops uh, in the very area that these things were flying. So uh, we end up doing a F-18. Uh, one of our F-18s does an interrogation on it. And then when they come back, they send up another set of F-18s and they actually start filming it with flare pods, which then is the result of the the famous, now famous yeah, Tic Tac footage that uh, everybody's seen and they've plastered across Fox News and a couple other uh, media outlets. And of course, all over the internet, um, which then end up also being... Uh, debuted in i think it was 2019 and the new york times did an article about the event uh because the pilots uh, one of the pilots came out of public about it dave uh commander for uh, dave fravor and from there it just kind of spread like wildfire through us that we're all there and a handful of us came out in support of commander fravor uh you know because this is a pretty dramatic event in all of our lives so uh Nobody wants to be the lone man standing there hold, hold, holding the post. So might as well get out there and help them. And uh, it was honestly uh, a big burden off my shoulders when, when I found out that it was public. Because, uh, I mean, when you don't talk about it for a long time and you just and you don't really tell anybody about it, you get, you know, you kind of kind of almost double, double take whether you actually see, saw anything or not or whether you're just kind of nuts. So it was uh, pretty reaffirming to know that it was all real. But as a result of that, um, the United States Navy and the DOD have admitted that these videos were real and that there is UAP resulting in, you know, just this last year, them briefing Congress that UA UAPs are actually a real thing. I want to ask you about the radar on this and trust me i'm i'm nowhere near a radar expert or anything like that but when you were witnessing and your team was witnessing these objects on the radar could you see them blipping in and out or could you see which direction they were coming from to see if they were some sort of potential human incursion um from what we could see initially, which is why it wasn't really uh, like a run over and engage them situation, is they were they were coming due south at about 100 knots, basically kind of going from Guadalupe down to Catalina and from down the channel down to Catalina. And they kind of would appear and they weren't going very fast, but the, the altitude is what was a little bit concerning is they're at 28,000 feet or so. Um, and, but they were only doing 100 knots. That's that's pretty pretty out there. Uh, you don't see too many objects rolling around at 28,000 feet doing doing that slow slow of a speed. And uh, after uh, we didn't really see anything spectacular until after the engagement of the F-18s. At that point, pretty much all hell broke loose with these things. Do you think that they were teasing you? And, and playing the game, if we could call it a game? Well, for me, I don't think they were playing at all. I don't even think they were teasing. I think they were just directly reacting to a outside stimulus to their, to, you know, presented, presented to them. Um, personally, I, I don't think these crafts were, were manned. I think they were AI or some type of drone. Uh, and I don't mean, a, you know, a drone from the government, you know, and I, I have no idea. And I only th don't think that it's one of ours because of just uh, the way that it could fly. I mean, it had you know, no flight profile. It had just about zero, it, a uniform heat signature, no engines, no flight surfaces, no wings, no propellers. And somehow it could stay up in the air. So these things are kind of uh, not conclusive to, you know, anything I know that we have. <laughs> Are you of the belief now looking back at this, you know, the last almost 20 years here, 18 years for you that these are of non-human descent or creation? Um, I'd say I'm still 60, 40 on the fence with that, you know, 60, 40, not, not of, uh, you know, 
not earth-based technology and 40 percent given given giving us some some uh some possibility that we could have developed something like this, you know, through whatever means necessary. Um, but now, when when you say we developed, are you talking the United States Black Projects? Are you talking China? Are you talking Russia? I'm just talking about Earth, period. Um, because I mean, we 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 have no way of knowing what kind of programs are going on all around the world. So I'm just talking about human technology in in period. Um, because when it comes down to it, uh, we got some serious issues going on when, when we have crafts like these just traveling all over the place without any type of checks or balances, you know, they outflew our best machines. <laughs> That's kind of concerning. I mean, F-18s are still pretty top notch even now, even with the F-22s that are out. Uh, Gary, I want to ask you, you know, a lot of the idea behind this uh, over the last four years is the word threat. And this has been a key argument through this entire phenomena that is going on. My question to you regarding the threat narrative that has been pushed well into Congress, the Senate, the media, at any time during that incident, were you guys threatened by these craft? No, I won't. I won't sugarcoat anything like that. I think the 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 threat comes from the fact that we have no way of protecting ourselves from these objects flying through our airspace. Um, it'd be like uh, if you had some type of creature running around your property. Like say Bigfoot came in there, but he was impenetrable and bulletproof, and you couldn't catch him. <laughs> and he decided just to you know, eh, every once in a while just run through your yard and take a big dump on it or run or won't run away. You know, so it's, 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 it's really just a situation and not being able to control our own airspace. And, you know, if the 40% is right and it is earth-based technology, that's, that's a bad thing for everybody that doesn't have that technology. No. And I understand that, especially if it's not American property, Yeah, you know, but I, I will say, though, uh, there was never a time I felt like I was an immediate threat during the entire incident. So there has been other incidents like this that have come out since then uh, on the East Coast, again, in the Catalina Islands area, where allegedly one of these Tic Tacs hovered about 60 feet above a helicopter deck of one of the frigates. I mean, would that be considered a threat? Um. Well, it's still, you know, objects that are not in our control in our airspace. So whether it's a, you know, a swarm of drones from China or whether it's a, a UFO from space or a UFO from underwater, it's, it's still something that can't be controlled by us. And when I say control, you know, don't get, don't get it twisted. You know, I'm not talking about, you know, we can't dominate it. You know, we just can't stop it, you know. They just, you know, not like, you know, you, I mean, you want, want Russian MiGs just flying across the United States <laughs> or flying across Canada. <laughs> nobody, nobody really wants their, 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 uh, their adversaries, you know, just open unfettered access to everything. And uh, it's, it's a little scary. Uh, the, the ramifications of it being off world are probably more scary than them being on, uh, you know, on, you know, from earth. What do you want them to be? Are you hoping they are of human technology or it, are you at the reality at the 6040, like you said, that we aren't alone in the universe, which would be next to Jesus Christ himself coming down from the heavens, <laughs> yeah. here, the well, second biggest story of mankind's history? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, honestly, if it is off world technology, I honestly, truly in my heart, deeply hope that it is. A situation where we're just a protected species of some type or some situation that we're just you know protects us uh because don't think that for one second we would stand a chance against anything with this level of technology if they decided not to be friendly 
So you're hoping it's human. I'm hoping that whoever it is that they have our best interest at heart. Because uh, if it's our government, well, we got a lot more problems than just a crappy. Uh, cr- or if it's the U.S. government, uh, we have a lot more problems than just a crappy president. Well, try living with our prime minister up here. You don't want that. <laughs> I've heard. You, I've heard. <laughs> you know, that's all I'm saying. You know, well, the, so can can, can he tell what day it is? Because if he can tell what day it is, he's already got one up on ours. Well, he can't count. We know that because, you know, there's like 50,000 semi-trucks heading to Ottawa right now, and he counted 12. So <laughs> well, that's, that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, moving on from the political side of everything, you know, there was a lot of talk about about people getting, when these Tic Tacs came around, that they were ordered below deck, They, you know, trying to limit the amount of eyes who could actually see this. Is that how it works in this situation? Um, well, I think that's yes and no. So when we did go to flight ops and we were currently engaging these objects, we would go to something called general quarters. Now, general quarters is a battle stations. You know, it's where, it's where you go, where you belong on the skin of the ship. All the hatches are batted. All, everything is, is tightened down in case of eminent attack. You know, you got to remember, we we have no idea what these are. I mean, period. I didn't feel like I was ever threatened, but you just don't know what they are. So you just get ready just so just in case something does happen. And so in that situation, nobody would be above the skin of the ship unless there was something wrong and they needed to go up above um, a situation where we would be in the skin of the ship when we were at general quarters would be like an emin- eminent boat attack or something of that nature you know say the bridge sees a small craft coming in we would then order a team of people with 50 60 cows or we would man the uh the mounted uh weaponry on the skin of the ship you know so those those are those are those are situations we would be outside but in this situation where it was a completely an air conflict we would all be in the skin of the ship we got just over 90 seconds to go here before we have to go to break At the bottom of the hour, Gary Voorhees is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. This has brought you into a whole new realm of life. And in the next half hour, we're going to talk about UAPX. And I know we can't go into a lot of detail because there are some NDAs that that are signed. But for you, Gary, at what point did you realize that this story was coming to fruition again and that you would have to... Ste- decide, make the decision to step up and speak about this? Uh, when I was asked by my shipmate, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he told me about Commander Fravor coming public with it and that he was coming public to support him. And uh, once I just verified that I didn't have an NDA and that my wife was at least somewhat comfortable with me doing it, uh, I went ahead and went full steam ahead. What did your wife say when you told her this? She's not real big in UFOs. Uh, she supports uh, the thing, the crazy idea, all all my crazy ideas. So uh, I got lucky in that aspect. No, no, I understand that. We got thirty seconds, but this is kind of cool. Um, when you told her that this is what happened in two thousand four, you were part of this. What was her reaction? Uh, she she didn't really want to talk about it. It's it, she is of the, uh, you know, she believes me and everything like that, but doesn't really want to discuss the possibility of off world life. It's scary for a lot of people. It is really scary. All right. And on that note, uh, I appreciate your, your honesty and your candor there. And I've never heard you uh, actually say that about your, your lovely wife. So I appreciate you sharing that with our audience. Gary Voorhees is here. When we come back from the break, we're going to learn more about the Tic Tacs. We're going to learn more about UAPX and the science behind UFOs. We're going to grill the bearded wonder that we call (laughs) Gary Voorhees. And then later on in the show, we're going to talk about helping veterans cope with their issues. We'll be back on SOI. We're clear. All right. 
Oh, well, you definitely back to back tonight. <laughs> oh, yeah. You weren't kidding. You keep me awake tonight. Oh, dude, you're on you're on par for some good for some good answers already, man. I just try to answer them as honest as I can, man. I, it's just how it goes with territory. I figure I just keep doing it that way, and it doesn't really matter how many haters I get. <laughs> oh, Michael Fontaine, thank you for your service, bud. Thank yeah. you for your service. Love it. Love it. Outstanding. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a couple army vets in uh, at the place I'm at right now. Very a cool. Of air, a couple of army, army airborne. God bless them. God bless them. All right. Uh, we've got some time here. That's a nice golf shirt. Yeah. Uh, Jason gave me this. Well, very cool. Very cool. To get you some SOR swag. <laughs> Definitely remind me to shoot you my my uh my address. Yeah, do that. Uh Dave, when you play the guitar riff intro, is that you playing? No, that isn't me. That's uh Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, currently of Asia and Sons of Apollo. The man, the myth, and the guitar legend all wrapped into one. It's a beautiful awesome. thing. Oh, and I love the new intro. I, that's the first time I saw the uh, the re redone one. I don't know how new it is, but I'm digging it. Yeah, yeah. that that one, uh, Vincent, my my video guy, has done a great job on. You know, fantastic yeah, he, job. He outdid himself with that. I'm just, uh, those, just said, those words by Reagan, they're just way way too powerful and very underrated to what we are talking about today. You imagine if he said that speech in today's world with what we know or what's been uh, let known to the public? Well, most likely he'd be canceled. <laughs> Cancel culture. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. I get I get irritated with that with that stuff. Yeah, me too. Me too. One of, my, one of my best friends growing up was a uh, a Nuke MM uh, Sherry. Why Navy? Me? Uh, my grandfather was uh, thirty two years Navy, senior chief bosun's mate. I grew up on sea stories. <laughs> oh, really? Yep. I mean, man, if uh, if I would have got in. It would have been uh, Air, Canadian Air Force. What I mean, we're all combined with the Canadian Armed Forces, where they're not segregated units. But that's where I was going. Yeah, I, I thought about the Air Force, and I'd actually went into the recruiting office. But the uh, we'll just say the uh, the particular attitude of the recruiter at the time was a bit disconcerting to me. So I just uh, all right now, I'll just go to the Navy. <laughs> Don't blame you. Don't blame you. Well, since then, I've met some great Air Force guys, but, you know, that particular guy, ugh. <laughs> he's, he's, I don't know where the Air Force got that guy, but I, I think he was the bottom of their barrel. <laughs> Mennonite Abe, Dave wants to kiss a megalodon. I want to go find a megalodon tooth in North Carolina. That's what I want to do. Tell you what, uh, go to uh, South Central uh, Florida. I mean, I'm trying to think of the. There's a there's a spot in Florida where you can actually go search for the megalodon teeth. Yeah, there's a place in Florida, and there's a big area in um, in North Carolina as well. And uh, I want to take my son there and and go digging for them. Yeah. And when uh, I've, I've brought pretty much every kid in my family down to get shark's teeth over at this uh, at the beach down in Florida, because you get these little you get these little net basket things, and you go down to the 
just where you know where the first the where it first starts starts dropping off and you take big baskets full of uh the sand and silt and you pull like a handful of shark's teeth out every every pull wow. Wow. All right. We got 10 seconds. Thank you to Simon Wales and Smithy and Cat Chaser for the super chats. It really supports what we do on this show. Here we go, everyone. Second half hour of Space Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight talking Tic Tacs, USS Nimitz, UFOs, UAPX, one of the co-founders of UAPX. We have Gary Voris here on the show, and we appreciate you being here, Gary. Thank you for taking the time with us. Hey, thanks for having me back again. <laughs> oh, no problem. No problem indeed. Gary, you know, you, you explained in the first half hour, and if our listeners miss that, you'll want to go back and check the archives on that one. But going through this, and right before the break, I asked how your wife reacted. But for you, when all of a sudden you saw this entire story coming out and playing inside the public eye, where now everybody from every major newspaper and television station around North America, and if not the world, were following this story of these three videos, the Tic Tac, the Gimbal, and the Go Fast, and you're a part of one of that. I mean, at what point did you say, I need to get involved? I know you mentioned that you had to check with your NDAs, but but at what point did you, were you convinced that you had to be a part of this for the sake of of just letting the public know? Well, when, when uh, Senior Chief Kevin Day had uh, contacted me, um, him and Dave Beatty were already working on a project to try to catalog as much information as possible um, and try to find other witnesses. Uh, you know, honestly, the only thing I was honestly waiting for is just the, the blessing from my wife because I had been thinking about this for so many years. I had, you know, basically just been driving myself mad trying to figure out what these things are by myself and uh i was happy that it was uh you know i was relieved i was happy it was like a an entire weight had been lifted off my shoulders you know like when coming out public about it it's kind of like see guys you can talk about it now you know i wanted to make sure everybody you know so else could feel that same way and even if they had to vicariously live through me, that was fine as, you know, as long as it was out and that it was public and that we weren't all nuts. Was it a good point of mental clarification? Uh, it, it definitely was. Uh, when, you know, when, when, a, when, a, when, a publication like the New York Times comes out with something like this, you know, it's, uh, it's vindication, you know, this isn't, you know, this isn't the Sun magazine here in the States or, uh, or a tabloid magazine, you know, where it's, you know, baby with five heads born and then, you know, oh yeah, and a Tic Tac, <laughs> you know, this is, this is a mainstream publication. So it was, uh, honestly a little overwhelming that such a prestigious paper would even do an article like this so you know that just shows you how serious the situation became uh and and how credible it ended up being you know so then it, it, the vindication itself is just was everything 
that that's it. It was everything. Just being vindicated. You know, it's not just a you, you got too many drinks in me story anymore. Oh, I hear you. I I hear you with that. Uh, okay, so let's continue on here because after this incident and after the play, you if if my timeline is correct, you and Kevin Day who has admitted to suffering PTSD from this event and everything that's that's gone on and we'll get into a lot of PTSD stuff later you know started the UAPX prior to that and even until this day you guys continue to be attacked by a lot of people in the UFO world regarding the credibility of these videos of the fact that you didn't see them with your own eyes, you were just looking at blips on a computer screen. I mean, what have you, how have you handled the critics who say, you didn't see what you saw, there's no way this exists, you just want your 15 minutes of fame, so on and so forth? Yeah, tough, I did see it with my own eyes. <laughs> I saw the entire video. I saw the better video that you never got to see. I got the ten-minute video that, you know, it, it, it did. It basically was the same video, but you also got to see it turn. You got to see a side view of it. You, it still didn't have a very clear defined where you could see the little legs that Fravor was talking about. But you see dark spots where those were. It was twice the resolution of the Tic Tac video. So I'd say that I, I can stand as a witness to what happened that day. Are you surprised that there has been as much high criticism from people in and around the UFO world? No. Why wouldn't there be? I mean, this is an extraordinary thing. It's, 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 it's something that unless you personally witnessed it, you know, it's just, it's just like, you know, how I deal with any phenomenon that I've not witnessed I'm try to be very polite to anybody, but I'm a skeptic to just about everything until I personally witness it. Do I think things are highly probable? Yes or no? It all depends. It depends on the person, depends on the situation. And I'm not surprised that this scares the shit out of people. Because if this is real, it means that a lot of things that you may think are not true. So getting back to you and Kevin Day. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, who's really uh, been affected by this, which he has taken personal criticism on from many people in the UFO world, trying to say, how can you have PTSD over watching videos? You know, you started UAPXY, both of you. Uh, because we wanted the answers. Uh, you know, we were denied the radar data. We were denied, uh, you know, any of the, the longer footage. We've been denied you know, any collaborative footage other than that small Tic Tac video. And since we couldn't get it from the government, we decided to go get it ourselves. Um, you know, it started as a pipe dream. And then, you know, now it actually is a reality. So it didn't even occur to us that we couldn't do this, that, you know, this, this just seemed to be the next natural step in the evolution of us, you know, um, and as for PTSD from, seeing a video, if you see a video that shouldn't be in existence and do things that shouldn't be able to be done, it kind of breaks your psyche. Uh, sorry to tell people. <laughs> well, I remember Kevin, when I interviewed him two years ago at UFO con 2022 or 2020, pardon me, he stated that the reason why he felt he had PS PTSD over this was the fact that he didn't know what it was. He And it was his responsibility and on his shoulders alone to protect the entire fleet because that's what his job was. And please correct me if I'm wrong on that or maybe I'm misconstruing something. But, I mean, that's a lot of stress when you have objects in the air. You don't know what they are. You don't know where they're from, whether they're friendlies or not. And you have literally thousands of people riding on your shoulders because you're the top radar guy. Yeah, when you can't when you can't perform that job and you have no idea what it is, you know that that's gonna that's gonna 
break anybody. Just like think of it like a soldier that went out and his whole uh, recon team that went out and couldn't get the recon, you know, and then somebody just decided to just take a stroll through our, <laughs> through, through, through our camp and didn't get caught. <laughs> So yeah, that can that can break somebody's psyche. Is it because the ninety nine point nine percent of us who will never be in that position don't understand the stress? I don't is believe, that a fair comment? I don't, yeah, I don't believe anybody can understand the stress until they're in that position. And you know, it's not even just the stress of the fact that he couldn't identify the object. It was it was a stress that the fact that this object couldn't be stopped, it couldn't be identified. They you know, flew our jets, and basically, in the same respect, it's his job to control the airspace. That in in that day, that day, that airspace could not be controlled. And then you see the video of it. I mean, there's there's no way in hell you can be right after that. I hear you. All right. So why start UAPX? Uh, but like just just like we've always said, we got to find answers. We got to get our own data. Um, you know. If uh, hell or high water, we'll figure out what at least as much as we can about this stuff. We're going to keep growing the company, keep growing our capabilities. Um, and we're going to find out what exactly these things are. Friend, foe, uh, on world, off world. Uh, basically, uh, I'll be uh, this is something I can tell you. If if this company ever folds up, it's on world tech. <laughs> Because that would mean that we got too close and they shut us down. <laughs> so, in that case, I would, I think it would be a safe assumption that it was the government. But that would be a situation where they knock on my door and they say, Mr. Voorhees, it would be you in your and your family's best interest for you to shut down UAPX. At that point, I would absolutely resign. Well, I, I mean, you, can't, you just can't fight the government. That's just, but, oh, hey. I can fully tell you, Gary, if the Canadian government came up to me and said, we will pay you X amount of dollars to shut down your radio show because we're tired of hearing the pressure that you're putting on our, us to talk about this subject, and here's a check, and it pays off my mortgage and my kids, you know, a little bit, I'm gone. I make no bones about that. I don't yeah, mind I don't saying I doubt that I they make, would pay me. I think they would just threaten me. <laughs> <laughs> a little different position, right? But I mean, and I'm not even saying that gently. You know, they no, came to yeah. me and said, "Hey, we'll shut you down, and but, uh, here's a check for you to go away." Oh until boy! Until then, until then, my vets and 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 the scientists that uh, all have volunteered their time for this project, we're going to keep plugging away. I mean, that's a lot of the reason why after our. You know, this interview with you, we're going to go dark for a while so we can focus on our research. Uh, we have so much to do that, you know, honestly, uh, the, the the social media and the interviews and these things are just kind of, they're a distraction right now. The distraction how? Well, uh, the more we're in the media... The more we can stick our foot in our mouths, the better, the worse off we could be. So I think it's, I, uh, you know, we, we all, as a team, we decided that it was just best for us just to focus on the company, grow the company, do our research, get our, get, get, get some white papers out there for a publication, do the things that we're promising to do so that we can be successful. And I think that in the long run, that's going to be, better for our community in the last number of, in the last number of months with uapx you guys you know made no bones about it you guys uh, did go out into the catalina island area and i do realize that there is a lot you cannot say regarding that due to specific ndas with media companies and other companies and and whatever and and i'm more than willing to to res respect that but what was it like for you going back out there to try and recreate that scene? Um, honestly, it was the best thing that had ever happened to me. Um, I felt I finally was doing what I was meant to do on this planet. Um, leading the team of guys in the expedition and the camaraderie, the way that we were able to work together, it was honestly 
the closest thing to magic that I've ever I've ever experienced in my entire life. I knew from then on that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Was that just being back on the sea or was that just the entire intention of the project? It's the, it was the, the, the team doing, doing the actual research, collecting the data, you know, that was, that was where it was at. That's, that's a, you know, uh, I, I unfortunately still have to be very vague because it would get into details of the movie. So, uh, oh, wait, I, we're not even really allowed to talk about the movie anymore. They, they, they're kind of getting down, they're getting down to the nitty gritty now and they're putting us on lockdown with this NDA, but it's, uh, it was an amazing experience that I can't wait to go out and do again. For you, I mean, a project like this never goes without some sort of controversy, you know, and I, and with all due respect, I do have to ask a couple questions regarding this. I, I mean, you parted ways with, with an, a few people over the last number of months regarding differing opinions and everything. I mean, how has that affected what you guys have done? Because some of it was very public. Um, well, the stuff that was very public, uh, that was initiated by me. Uh, I particularly had a very, very, very strong distaste for a particular person that was in our company. Um, and I didn't agree with actions that he did. And from then on, I then went to the rest of the company and, and they agreed and we removed them. And then there was another, another situation where, you know, people come and go, you, you, you just got to keep moving forward. Uh, it's a company like any other, we're going to have people come, we're going to have people go, we're going to take hits. We're going to not take hits. We're going to, you know, that's just how it is. Okay. You've also taken a lot of criticism uh, about teammates that you do have on on their online persona, have you nipped that in the butt? Uh, as best as I can. Uh, he's still an asshole. <laughs> excuse, excuse me if I can't say that, but he'll know exactly who I'm talking about. And you know what? He has done better, but he's always going to be opinionated. He works very hard for my company. He has probably done, you know, sing singly, he has done an amazing job in a lot of the things that we need him to do. And I can't go into details just because it's intercompany stuff, but he works his butt off for us. He is a good person. And if anybody even gave him half a shake to d decide to sit down and talk to him in a non-hostile situation they would see that too. Okay. One of the, one of the things that you uh, did uh, lose this year was your, was one of your major tech guys. And I apologize. His name is off the top of my head right now, but I mean, how do you bounce back from somebody who was allowing you to use literally hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment in order to, you know, regain what you have to do. If all of a sudden, say, A and E calls up or Discovery Channel calls up, and says, "We want this. We want this on a frequent basis." You just go out and get new equipment. I don't know what kind of complicated answer people want, but that's it. Business goes on. It was it was a hit. You move on. You do the best you can. You get new equipment. That's all you can that. do. Yep. <laughs> There's no big thing about it. And I wish him the best. He was uh and he was extraordinary when he worked with us. He decided to, you know, do his own thing. Um it was an opportunity. He helped us out tremendously, and now we move on. That's it. How do you fill those positions? Because I mean, there's a I few mean, positions there. You don't. Uh the board of directors that's acting now is going to be the only active members of UAPX. Uh, from now on, we decided that instead of just, you know, bringing a crap load of people on that we bring people on with special skills as consultants. If they end up being invaluable at a certain point, then we probably might vote them on the team. Uh, but we're just going to keep the team small. 
and just, you know, ask the community for things that we need, you know, uh, we're going to, you know, if we need a particular type of analyst or a particular type of scientist, we're just going to put out that we're looking for a volunteer for that. And if we get one cool, if we don't, I'll just learn the damn thing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and, and you know what? I mean, that's, I, I admire your attitude regarding that because social media can be, can be crass. It can be rude. I've had shots fired at myself. Friends of mine have had fire shots fired at them and it's not a fun place. So basically what you're doing is if I read this correct with UAPX is right now, you're keeping the team small, circling the wagons, waiting for the opportunities to arise when you can go public. Now, when do you plan on going public with the UAPX findings from your trek in, back into the Pacific? Once those findings are finished being finded. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of data to go through still. Um, uh, we've got some really good stuff right now that we are currently writing up, but that's just a small amount of the data that we've gone through. Um, not saying that I mean, we could go through everything else we have and have nothing, but I have a feeling that that's not going to be the case. So as we get stuff, we will be releasing it. You know, so as we release a white paper, we'll definitely have a, you know, full write up about it. We will provide that data to people. We will be providing it for other people to peer review those particular things. And then as we as we find it and analyze it, you're going to get it. So once we're out from underneath the NDA and the the uh, whole situation is is wide out in the open, and we can be more candid about the things that we are doing, um, we will be. You know, the one the one good thing about our company is we we really don't have anything to hide. Uh, we won't go into people's personal business or personal workings of the company itself or interpersonal relationships. But honestly, that's that's just how businesses are. I, I don't expect you to tell me about, you know, the sound guy you fired two years ago. So, you know, that's that's kind of kind of how it goes. I, I don't know if there was a sound guy fired. Sorry if there was. That was a hypothetical. <laughs> so but, you know, the background, the background is just the background. It's, it's what we produce that's going to be important. And it's going to be a long trip and it's going to be a good trip and we're all going to go to do it together. Um, we're going to need a lot of help. Uh, the kind of money that we're going to do for expeditions, unfortunately, doesn't come with, from Twitter. But the kind of money that does run our everyday operation does come from Twitter and people that support us. So in that respect, you know, we may not be doing any more interviews, but we will still provide, you know, I still will be available on Twitter. Uh, we have a Discord channel, um, you know, so we're still going to make ourselves available to the public to talk to. The scientists that you have involved with this project, how important is it for you guys to have those key members di dissect and decipher the information for peer review as we got about 40 seconds left. Well, it's very important because eventually I want to sit in the auditorium while they get their, their, uh, their Nobel prize. <laughs> so I, uh, I, it's very important to me because I, I really want to make sure that their, uh, their reputations stay intact as, as very well-respected uh, professors. All right, my friend, I'm going to get you to hold on right there as we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour as we have our good friend Gary Voorhees here on Spaced Out Radio, UAPX, UAPs, and so much more when we get into hour two. We're going to get into the experiences, what it's like to go through this process. There's a lot he can't say due to NDA but I think we'll be A-OK -okay with the questions we will ask this proud veteran when we come back on the Mighty SOR. All right, buddy, we got uh, six minutes. All right. 
Hmm. One hour down. Hey, I made it through one. <laughs> we'll get to through the next one. Oh, uh, only for you, brother. Only for you. Appreciate that. Yeah. It was bad, Mennonite Abe. It was terrible. It <laughs> what was is terrible. It? My rhyming. No. <laughs> Apparently, Mennonite Abe does not like rhyming. <laughs> So you guys getting a lot of snow up there? Yes. I guess there's supposed to be a nor'easter coming in right where I'm at now. I really uh, don't need any more snow. <laughs> I'm just hoping that the storm holds off long enough for me to fly home on Friday. <laughs> no kidding. Oh, I miss my family so much, dude. It's been two weeks, and I, I'm ready to be home now. I don't blame you. All right. Sorry. All the time during the break, all of a sudden I'm imploded with, with <laughs> messages from listeners. Oh, I so. know. Hopefully, I'm answering things better, better, better than a, better than uh, most people thought. But I'm sure it's still not good enough because I know, I, I honestly, I can't wait until we can we can speak more candidly about things. Um, so it's it's just a waiting game. Just be patient, smile, and keep working. <laughs> But I am full time doing UAPX now, though. I don't. I don't work a day job anymore. Oh, really? Yeah. When did you make that change? Uh, it's been about four months, I think now. <coughs> hmm. Mostly, I got let go from my company, so made the, made the jump easy. <laughs> yeah. Been there, done that. No longer a cable guy. I guess he's got too old and a little too armory. James, you think it blows your mind? Try being there when it happened. I'd say a good third of my PTSD is just from knowing that they, these things exist. Uh, I like UAPX. I like the way it sounds, and it's actually UAP Expeditions, Michael. Is uh, Michael W. Hall still involved? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's still kicking around. <laughs> Love Michael. He's a character, man. Hey, John. Good to see you, man. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, I saw an aircraft that could do around Mach 25 with no wings. You should worry about that, <laughs> Abe. <laughs> Anybody else come on in here? Uh, Callie, that already happened. Yeah, they can't release the Yeah, we can't talk about it, though. Not yet. They're NDAs. Oh, and I know a, lot, a big question I, I definitely get a lot, and that will be for the internet only, guys, here. How long until we go back on? Oh, we got uh, two minutes. All right. So a lot of people are asking us, especially ask me a lot lately, you know, what happens if we do get actual disclosure? Well, then we get a lot more money to do the work that we're doing now, and we get to actually study them, study them openly. So that's what happens if we get real disclosure, because unless unless they're going to come out with all, I have a feeling that the government just knows a lot more characteristics about these things and has a better idea how they work. 
other than that, I have a feeling that they don't know a whole lot, at least not the surface government that we all know. <laughs> if there is a deep state, they probably know more, but I don't think you'll ever get the deep state uh, uh, disclosure that we want. We got one minute here. Uno momento. All right. Got any more questions? Hurry up and get them in. Mm hmm. And then I'm going to ignore you again while I talk to Dave. <laughs> Nope, doesn't mean never. It just means I signed something that said I wouldn't do something until a certain time. Hi, Nikki in Seattle. How are you? Big thank you to Cat Chaser, Smithy, Simon, Michael, and Dry Toast, the best name in YouTube for the... Uh, just best name in YouTube, fuck it. And appreciate the super chats, everyone. And uh, we're going to kick off the second hour of Spaced Out Radio coming up here. Like five seconds. Uh, Polo, yeah. if that's true, that'd be really fucking cool. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hi to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the, pay the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam is at the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Fabacious. Fabacious is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets a password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight talking about UAP expeditions. This is a very, very good cause trying to figure out what in the heck these Tic Tac objects are and other anomalies flying in friendly skies. Joining us tonight, one of the co-founders of UAPX, Gary Voorhees, who is also a part of the 2004 USS Nimitz Tic Tac incident. Gary, welcome back. Hey, good to be here. I just want to touch quickly on the what we talked about earlier regarding the changes that have been made to the lineup. And you know what? Lineup changes are going to be made. I've made changes, many a changes, over the, the time of this show and continue to do so. I mean, because there is always something that comes up that you either don't want in public or, or what have you. You know, for you in general, the way this has played out, over the last number of months, have you ever thought of just, you know, stepping back and saying, man, I don't want to do this anymore? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> to be in charge of sucks sometimes. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, we've, we've gotten down there and not known where the next dollar was coming from, or there were so many things going on that I just, you know, it was too hard to, process and then i'd sit back and say man you know i probably should just stop putting my family through this i should stop just this this is a lot of stress for not a lot in return i should probably just resign and just let these guys do what they want and you know i'd be a liar if i said i never thought that and you know, even the guys, if they're watching this, are probably going to be like, what? <laughs> you know, but it's stressful. You know, um, Kevin was running this the ship for a while. Uh, Kevin had to step down due to health issues. Um, yeah, these things, these things are stressful. You know, you're, you, every, everybody looks to you for, 
you know, the final say or the, 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 the big opinion. Um, so absolutely. Yes. I've thought about quitting. Okay. So the fact that you continue on and you've had to deal with a lot of drama and arguing both behind the scenes and private groups and online and things getting leaked, things that aren't supposed to be leaked and rumors and everything. How do you keep it together to keep the focus on what's going on? Because there was a lot of heavy, heavy type of, of rumors and, and, and words, some combative, some not so combative, some big questions, credibility questions that have gone along with this. I mean, that's a lot on one's shoulders. Well, when it comes down to it, um, those, those negative opinions about you only have as much control as you let have over you. Um, things can get overwhelming sometimes. And yes, you might have these negative thoughts of, you know, giving up and, you know, just packing up and just living a simple life, flipping the channels and doing nothing. But when it comes down to it, that's not who I am. Um, uh, I don't really care who calls out my credibility. Um, show me your proof. Show me your rock solid proof. Uh, show me why you think. And I'll sit down and talk to anybody. I've proven that in the past. I sat down with Mick West. I'll sit down with anybody. Um, I'm not going to sit down for a witch hunt. You know, I think I think Lou had to deal with the same stuff, except on a much larger scale. You know, and for us, our vindication is when we're successful. Right. You know, you know our vindication will be when we've we've contributed. You know, when we've finished analyzing all of our data. You know, if we have something that's super amazing, I can't wait to watch your faces. If we've got stuff that's yeah, just okay. Well, we'll keep getting stuff until your face is amazed. But I'm going to keep at it, you know, and as long as I don't get shut down by the government, and if, even if it's just me sitting with a telescope and a FLIR camera in my backyard, UAPX is never going to die. So as long as, you know, like I said, as long as I'm not shut down by the government, this will just keep going. I don't care I about mean, Yeah. You have had to battle, though, uh, between agents and producers and and financiers and everything along those lines uh publicly mm -hmm. and how that got out i have no idea uh i know there's been other shows that have uh, that have uh you know questioned a lot of uh the integrity that kind of goes along with this i mean considering you've never run a company before much like i haven't before i started this show has it been a live and learn process? Is there is there regret you have for things that have come out looking back on it? Because hindsight can be twenty twenty at times. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll be honest with you. If I if I did get some of that that twenty twenty four sight, I probably should have trusted my gut a little bit more and made changes quicker. Um, I think that would have saved a lot of uh, a lot of anguish in the future. Um, I know when I first got control of the company, I, I did make some cuts and, you know, and they weren't even cuts for people. I mean, I, I, I took people like Dave Beatty off the lineup, which is one of my, you know, he's family to me, you know, so it was just a matter of resources, act, you know, actual situations of need for these people, you know, there's, they had great skill sets, but we didn't need them. So rinse, repeat, move on. And then the people that we did need that left, well, that sucked. We move on. People that we thought we needed, and I should have gotten rid of way sooner than I did. Well, live and let learn. You know, I'll learn. I learn from my mistakes and I'll keep moving on. You know, so yeah, I've never I've never ran a company before, but a lot of people haven't. And I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to correct mistakes and I'm going to have information that gets out and just keep moving on. I mean, that's, I really, that, unfortunately, that's just going to be always the answer when it comes to any problems, because there's never, ever, ever going to be a problem. There's only solutions that I haven't thought of yet. Okay. I want to move on because I know we are running out of time here in regards to a lot more I need to ask you in the next 45 minutes. You brought up Lou Elizondo's name. 
and the pressure and everything that he has being, you know, to quote, end quote, the, the face of the franchise, so to speak, regarding ufology, which, you know, there's been a lot of questions about Lou's credibility, his position as a spy, his position as uh, someone who is an interrogator by train, uh, somebody who has been a war hero, a patriot. I mean, there's a lot of love and there's a lot of hate for the man. I mean, I know you've talked with him and, and had conversations about what's gone on. And did you know Lou before he became public? Um, only in the respect that, uh, you know, when he was with stars to the, uh, to the stars Academy and when he was doing the first season of, uh, uh unidentified uh i had spoken to him over on the phone and he had, you know he's the one that called me to ask me if i wanted to be on the show and then uh then chris mellon came out and interviewed me and then I, i've spoken i speak to him on occasion um he has never done me wrong and he's his information's always seemed pretty valid to me uh, i've got no problem with him uh you know he's working towards a Regardless of what he is, you know, he's made it very clear. He still works government contracted. You know, I mean, I don't think he's been, I thought he was, I thought he was being pretty transparent. <laughs> I mean. What do you think? Like, about, well, yeah. let me change the subject here. What do you think about the people or the rumors out there, whether it's Mick West or others who do not believe that he held down a position at the Pentagon did not run the ATIP or OSAP program, did not uh, run any UFO program, and is basically, you know, just a figurehead that has come out of the woodworks and could potentially be a disinformation agent regarding this UAP subject. Because anything to do with government and UFOs, there's a, a really thick line between the two. Yeah, I think I think it's hard to prove it one way or another. And you know, you, you know me from from everything else. Uh, I'm I'm not going to sling any mud where I can, where I don't need to. And I, I personally think that the man is has all as as good intentions and is is trying to drive this at least in the direction that we want to. So I say, uh, hang on and uh, enjoy the ride for now. It, you know, if it comes up later on that you know. He was a dis dis disinformation agent. Well, I mean, how are you going to find out? I mean, how are you really going to know? I mean, just because somebody's opinion. I mean, when it comes down, I think the only thing that really was uh, up for debate is whether there was two different A tips. You know, whether there was like a boys' club A tip that he was in charge of, and then you know the the one that was being funded. Um, I don't know enough about that really to ha have an educated answer about it. Mm hmm. Okay. So him being the face of the franchise, taking a lot of the heat that has become the UFO world. Do you think it's fair what he has gone through? I mean, you I were kind of, if... you were kind of doing the same thing, Gary, but on a much lesser scale persona wise. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, you know, if he's, you know, if he's dead nuts exactly who he says he is and everything like that, which I don't have any reason to believe he's not, um, the man's taking a lot of crap for us. Uh, you know, so no matter what, you know, you should give him a little, little respect for just being able to take all that crap and continue on doing what he's doing. So with that respect, I, you know, I, I salute him, you know, keep, 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 keep doing what you're doing. Keep paving the way for guys like me. Um, if that paves me as a the next insider, I, I don't really care. <laughs> the opinion, opinions are like, you know what? <laughs> Everybody's got one. <laughs> it happens. It really does. Uh, let's get to some audience questions here. The right. Magician Joshua is asking, he says, first off, thank you for your service. Lieutenant Ryan Graves said at first, Tic Tac seemed oblivious. Later, there was a near miss. What do you think the thoughts on their change of behavior was? I think they were directly reacting to the officers flying towards them. 
you know, so they're flying in to in, in, you know investigate these things, and these things are then reacting to them. You know, uh, they seem, you know, they didn't, uh, they seem to basically mirror their flights at first, and then go off and do what they want. Um, it that's really that's all I can say about it. I mean, that's that's the only thing I really observed is the fact that these things just really didn't do anything they were very benign until they were in in engaged all right let's go to kim here who is asking now did you actually see the tic tac for yourself or was was this just on video uh i did see the full video and if you count seeing them way the heck away on the horizon through the big eyes i did see them through the big eyes what they look like through the big eyes a speck <laughs> that moved really weird. And basically when you're looking at one of these specks until it actually moves in a very, you know, in either straight up or just, or, or they would just disappear instantaneously. You really wouldn't know you were looking at them until they moved. When they moved, I'd know for certain that I was looking, I was seeing one. Kind of like all the blurry videos that you get to see online. No, I, I can fully understand that. You know, I, I'm just thinking, like, here you are. It is, a little bit more, it is a little bit more accurate, though, because I am going down to the radar scopes, finding the bearing, the elevation. I know exactly where it is in the sky. So <laughs> I did have that advantage. Okay, but when you look through the big eyes to, to see these little specks, you know, were you guys, when these started coming in, almost put into a battle-ready position or any type of security that that was called on? I, I apologize. I don't know the wording, okay? I apologize. Um, I was freaking. I was geeking out. But the cat. it was a very casual attitude with the, with the chain of command we weren't in a aggressive posture we weren't in until we like i said until we engaged everything was just business as normal so you were allowed on the deck or no yeah oh yeah uh on the uh now depending on who was on the bridge is whether you got to go out to see the use the big guys because if certain people were on the bridge, they were very observant, and you couldn't slip out there. Um, like, ironically, if Mr. Sean Cahill was on the bridge, I went nowhere near the bridge because Mr. Cahill arrested me once. <laughs> really? Really? I didn't know that. Well, uh, when, I, when we first got back from our first deployment, I was uh, going through a messy divorce and uh, had done some shenanigans where I was... Uh, had an unauthorized absence for quite a while and he was sent to retrieve me. <laughs> How many days in the brig did you get for that? Zero. Mm. I was the only Aegis computer technician on that ship. And I kind of covered my ass and we won't go into the reasons why. <laughs> Nicola is asking, why do you think the government wants to keep this phenomena a secret? Uh, because of their ignorance, I, I honestly think that the general government itself, which when you say the government, you're not think you're not. Are you talking about the federal government? Are you talking about the CIA? Are you talking about the Air Force, the Navy? You see what I'm see where I'm going with that? There's a lot of hands in this cookie jar. So just to say why the government wants covered up, the government wants covered up because they don't know enough, and it will show just how ignorant they are. CIA the individual agencies that have studied these things in depth. Well, it's all about information. You know, you have the information is valuable. Let's go to Nicole here. Gary, what's it like working with a female powerhouse like Caroline? Um, she is a very demanding person, a very, uh, she knows exactly what she wants and she goes for goes for the gusto no matter what it's been a definitely a 
unique and uh, enlightening experience working with her. And uh, we we made a uh, we, it was uh, something I wouldn't trade for the world. All right, let me get to another question here. That Caroline Corey is who we're talking about here, mm-hmm. and you know, it, is she still involved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're going into places where I can't talk, though. Oh, okay. Uh, I just, yeah. I would sneak one in there. See if I, I can thought, yeah, you yeah, guard. Yeah, nice track. Guard there. Yeah, no, Car- Carolyn's a sweet lady, and uh, we 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 enjoyed working with her. Right. The expedition, and, and I know I got to tread carefully with this as we get to more audience questions here in just a little bit. The expedition that you guys did, that you guys went back out to Catalina Island, can you give us any tips on how that came together? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that, that's, a, that's a dead no. I can't talk about that at all. Okay, so you did I mention... I can tell you how the original idea came together with me and Kevin. Sure, do that. All right, so Kevin Kevin had called me about starting UAPX, and he originally had the idea to charter two, two uh, uh, boats and go out and have sonar tow to raise and have uh, US, uh, the, uh, the underwater UAPs and uh, all kinds of stuff uh, until I made a budget. And we realized that that's uh, very, 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 very expensive. I can understand so, that. Yeah. So we did. We did change plans, and everything kind of, uh, you know, our plans. That we we spent three years planning it. So. Okay. So you did mention earlier on that you did go out back to Catalina Island, and in that area, for those of us who've never been there, how? How far is it from San Diego? How long did it take to get to that area? Uh, from San Diego, it's probably a couple hours away um, by slow trot. Um, I did get to go back out there for filming uh, Expedition X uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, so last January, I was on the island personally. Um, I did get to scout the island out pretty thoroughly uh, during that time. Um, anything after that is under NDA because it starts to fall in under the things that we, we, we may or may not have done with the movie. All right. Is there a possibility if I was to assume that there were findings regarding the expedition? I don't think we would write up taking a vacation. We got one minute to go here before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Gary Voorhees is our guest tonight on spaced out radio topic of change here. Your own experiences after this happened. Have you seen more UFOs? Yes. Is that something you're comfortable in discussing? I unfortunately can't because it was under another project and I never expected to see it, but I did. And this was the first up close and personal, not through a telescope, not through a radar, not, not on video, but I will say it was amazing. And it did look just like the Tic Tac, but round. Interesting. Yeah, and it may be just the angle I saw it at. It looked round, and it could have been a tic tac. I'm hoping, but I mean, it had the same coloring, same texture, the way that the 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 tic tac glowed from the inside out, and seemed kind of like a universal, seem metallic, but not. I mean, it just it was amazing. All right, let's hold it right there. We got Gary Voorhees for another thirty minutes here on Spaced Out Radio, continuing the UFO UAP talk. Spaced Out Radio continues right after this. So sit back, relax, enjoy, because we will be right back. All right. 
All right, there we go. We're clear. All right, Kim. No, I've never seen a being other than the things that are on our planet. Um, what's the time? Of very good day. This says, does this mean Gary didn't see a Tic Tac on the UAPX Catalina trip? I don't think he can say anything to do with that right now. No, I can't. Um, I'm just trying to go Greg, back here. Greg is yeah. asking, why did it take a few days to engage? Uh, I, You'd have to ask my superior officers. Uh, to be dead honest with you, I was E4 at the time, which basically means I was not in charge of anything other than the computers and running running stuff. Uh, I had no operational pull. I was not very important when it came to chain of command. And uh, you would have to ask my captain. And since he denies he the event, Has your captain but, ever come publicly on this? Nope. According to him, nothing ever happened. He went that way. Eh? Yep. Yeah, he wanted nothing to do with this. He didn't really want to do anything, do do anything, even when we were there. Is he is he pissed that all of you have come out? I don't think I don't think he cares. I'm pretty sure he's just in a cushy job somewhere at this point. So I think he's just all right. Um, Stryber said in an interview, military people who interact with UFOs sometimes have their family members start having experiences. Did that happen to me? Um, not that I know of. Uh, a lot of my family is kind of crazy anyways, so I'm not sure I'd believe them. Um, yeah. <laughs> then, let's see, do you believe in underwater alien bases? I think it is highly plausible, but if they're, if they're not bases, then they would be refueling depots for hydrogen-based, uh, 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 some type of cold fusion. Um, GameVet is asking, where's the data, radar, sonar picks, videos, uh, the three videos don't show anything. They do show a lot to the skilled eye, and your guess is as good as mine where all that data went. Um, uh, number of questions about Sean Cahill. He's on his own personal media blackout. He's writing a blog for Medium, and at this time doesn't feel that he needs to say more. Sounds good to me. <clears throat> I'm about to do the same. <laughs> I, I will. Me. I Go will. Ahead. I will say this: that the invite has been passed to Sean Cahill for the Las Vegas party, and mm -hmm. he's going. Uh, he's going to try and make it. He wants to be there. So I don't know if he's going to be able to make it. I'm hoping he will make it. Fingers crossed that we could get Sean Cahill back in front of SOR soon. Nah, he's good people, but you know, you gotta remember uh the public, yeah, and you know, especially UFO Twitter and everything like that, it 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 gets to be too much sometimes and you just gotta pull back and do your thing for a while and then come back reinvigorated, reinvigorated, you know. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, I've spent a lot of time away from the family this, this year already. Um, I know that's in April. As a matter of fact, my birthday is the 25th of April. So if anybody wants to give me a gift, uh, <laughs> no. Um, but uh, if it is all possible, I will try to be there. Well, you, you, really, are, you, are invited. you are invited. I appreciate that, sir. Um, we love Gary. everybody's invited. <laughs> I thought I you would get. Yeah, I know a lot of sailors uh, won't come forward, and I know why. Uh, there's still too much of a stigma left on it. Um, a lot of people either have their own businesses. A lot of people are still working for the government, and some of them are still actually active duty. So. Um, but I do. I, I hope in my heart that some more come out. Um, I really thought, you know, after your incident, many other incidents that became public, I really thought that we would see the floodgates really open. Well, I mean, look look at what we've got in just the last five years, though. I mean, it, compared to what we got for 70 years, that is kind of like the floodgates. I mean, 
we've literally have Congress being briefed about UAP. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, no matter what anybody says, that's absolutely amazing. Even if they're just given bullshit, it's still, they admit they're real. That's big. <laughs> well, trust me, I know that. All right, man, we got like 10 seconds left. Thank you to Magician, Michael, uh, Cat Chaser, Smithy, Simon, Michael again, and Dry Toast for the Super Chats. Here we go with the final half hour with Gary here, guys. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. Remember, all of our archives are free. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor. Hit that subscribe button, our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on Twitter, or TikTok, pardon me, at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on with Gary Voorhees till the top of the hour, UAPX, UAP Expeditions, the USS Nimitz sighting of the Tic Tac. He was there, and he's got the beard to prove it. Gary, welcome back. Hey, how's it going? I want to start out with a question from John here, who is asking, more words is that they have some kind of hyper-advanced sonic defense tech to obliterate anything or anyone that comes close to their bottom of the ocean bases. Do you think there's ocean bases for these UFOs, UAP? Um. I think if they're not bases, then they'd be refueling stations. Uh, the most pl a plethora abundance of uh, hydrogen would be available in the ocean. And since, you know, we haven't really gone in most of it, I think that it would be the best place to refuel. All right. Spaghetti Lee is asking, do you feel that more sailors or witnesses from the Nimitz, and I'll add to that, other events or other ships will come forward eventually? I think as the, I, I really hope so. I know with the Nimitz encounter, it's it's hard because a lot of those guys are still active duty. Some of them all hold clearances still, work for the government. Um, at least the guys you want to come forward are, are, are in those positions. Um, maybe as they retire, uh, we'll get more people. And I hope that the, the stigma goes away. And, the, and then the, the government actually will let these witnesses come out and talk to us. How many sailors have reached out to you personally maybe they weren't part of the nimitz or or whatever but maybe other you know from other bases other ships and reached out to you and say i saw that i've well, seen something like that i don't but i I'm, I'm scared to go public what's that conversation like um i get emails on the daily uh you know sometimes only two or three a day sometimes i get 10 or 13 a day but over the entire time since I've come out public about this, I've had thousands of emails from civilian pilots, military pilots, uh, soldiers from Iraq, Afghanistan, people stationed all over the world that tell me their stories, you know, that, you know, you don't know who I am. I'm not going to tell you who I am, but here's my story. And that basically says that they honestly, I hold a lot of that as credible stories. Um, but it's for them to, it's kind of like a, a venting process. You know, if I wish I had somebody for 19 years to be able to just vent everything that I saw and, uh, I'm here for anybody that wants to vent about it and your confidentiality will always be kept with me. Okay. So these people obviously, you know, of military descent feel comfortable in sharing that with you, are in, in those stories, and I don't want to pry too much because those are private letters. Don't need to know mm -hmm. names or anything along those lines. I give lines. generalities about it, though. Um, you know, a lot of orbs, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of tic tac shapes, cigar shaped stuff, uh, especially in near Europe and in, in uh, you know Scandinavia, a lot of uh, cigar shaped uh, objects. 
Um, some of them are pretty wild. Some of them aren't, but a lot of them are very similar to the stories that we tell about the Nimitz encounters and like the, the 2015 event off the East coast too. So uh, the similarities are a bit eerie in some of these letters. So it's just kind of confirms to me in my mind that we're on the right track. Are you surprised no one from that 2015 has come forward yet? Um, like you guys did, or do you think there were tighter I thought, I thought, NDAs put in place? I thought that's what Graves was from. Well, Graves was a pilot, but I mean, I'm saying other shipmates, people like in your position, except on the East Coast. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that more people haven't come out about it. Um, or maybe they just don't have as big a mouth as I do. <laughs> True, true. That That is one large mouth. Let's just be honest here. Yeah, All right, I like this question from Apollo. I saw some animations that show the Tic Tac having little feet-like appendages. Is this accurate, or was this completely featureless? All right, so it was reported by Commander Dave Fravor that there were L-shaped appendages coming off the bottom. Uh, that was from, an, he is an eyewitness. Um in the actual film, you could tell that there was some type of shadowed area underneath where there where those appendages would have been, but you couldn't see them in any great detail. Okay. So do you think, or let me ask you it this way, what is the public missing from the story that they have heard over and over again publicly about that incident? Um, what are we not getting? Uh, probably how much precedence it's been set. Just the fact that we have what we have with this. Um, you have everything I have. I mean, that's just the simple truth of it. And this, uh, yeah, we've told you everything we could that we could remember. Uh, 20 years 20 years ago was a long time so we've told you everything that we could possibly remember um now it, it falls in the government hands if you want to know more about it so start getting good at foia requests anybody gets a good foia request with some good give me get me some information i'll be pretty happy um so far all the ones from people i know that have done they've, they've come back with either inconclusive or they're just not going to give it to us <laughs> Have you been asked to testify in any sort of future congressional hearings if they happen? I've been told that I would be included in them, but I haven't been asked to join any of them. Would you? Yes. I would testify in front of Congress. You think you'll ever get the opportunity? I really hope so. That uh, would be... Uh, I think we would have we would actually achieve something, and if we could at least get, um, you know, even if it's just the pilots and the more the the, the more higher ranked people, uh, I would just like to see some open door hearings about it. I want to ask you regarding the public perception of this, because this being a twenty four hour society, we take things in, we get offended or concerned, and then we drop it for the next whatever case it is. We're more worried about our image than we are about the world around us. We are more worried about the clothes we wear, the houses we have, the, the, you know, the names we choose our children or our pets than we are about what is really beyond comprehension like UAP. My question to you regarding this is, do you think the public even cares about this subject? Granted that every time something UFO is on the air or printed in a newspaper or on television, it's always very highly rated. I think in general, they don't care. I think that we have to make them care. We have to show them why this is important. Um, you know, Elon Musk says it very, very clearly. 
you know, he's doing what he's doing because he sees the beginning of the end of us if we stay here. Well, that's true if we don't know who's here, too. You know, we may not be able to succeed to get off this planet unless we have technology to get off this planet. If we could find, like, say, say these, these ships are all, they say they are alien, but they're all AI driven on world that just monitor this planet. They left them behind. Well, if we can get a hold of this technology and use it, that means that we are now an interstellar race. That's a big thing. That's life changing. That means supplies any place in the world instantaneously. That means being able to travel amongst the our solar system at the minimum, in, in just about instantaneously. Never mind, you know, whatever the max cap capabilities of these crafts are. You know, that's a really big deal. That's bigger than anything else on this planet. There's no other problem on this planet that's bigger than that. So let me ask you this, because I do want to change topics here in a few minutes. Do you think the public in general is ready for any sort of disclosure? Because I think what we have now is confirmation. Mm -hmm. We have confirmation that it exists. I think, it, and, and Sean uh, Cahill, ha, or pardon me, Lou Elizondo has kind of said, this is all in, in phases. It's got to be in phases. Okay. Um, you know, phase one was the threat narrative that we no longer see a threat, you know, and, and if anybody was paying attention, you know, midway through last year, we stopped hearing Lou and Chris Mellon use the word Russia or China, which they always did for the first three and a half years of everything move, you know, and then moving forward, we, we start getting more phase two that, that this is something of an unknown phenomena that we need to research, we need to fund, and then all of a sudden, slowly, people start talking aliens. From Elizondo and Mellon, all the way to the Pentagon, all the way to NASA and Bill Nelson. So the, the point that I'm getting at here is, there's been a lot of clues, man. A lot of oh, clues, yeah. and yet the public just doesn't seem to be fully understanding or comprehending what is going on. So do you well, think... Though. Well, I know that, but do you think there's a major plan in place then for a real disclosure and a lot less confirmation? Yes, and I think we're watching it happen. I think that they will roll this out in a way where it ends up being yesterday's news before it began to be today's news. And I think they're doing it in that the way on purpose so that things like, I mean, just, just Look at the serious things like the pandemic. You know, some people say there's no virus at all. Some people say there's a virus, but don't take it serious. Then there's other people that are like literally locking themselves in their house, scared to walk outside their doors. We're going to get all of that, the same thing with, the, with, with this type of disclosure. You know, you're going to have people go nuts because they're not going to believe their religions anymore. You're going to go people just not believe it, period. You know, and of course, that's going to be a little rough for them. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, I think we're seeing it as it's happening now. It's unfolding just in, right in front of our eyes. What do you think the worst case scenario is? Worst case scenario, we've never been in charge of our own existence. Best case scenario, we've been protected during our entire existence. It is a scary thought. It is. It's big. It's bigger than anything anybody has ever thought when it comes to our human existence. It's the, it's literally the same feeling everybody had when they realized that the world was round. We're coming to that same crossroads. Hmm. Well, I want to talk to you about something personal as we got about 10 minutes left. All right. And and that is about your PTSD. You are you are coming from uh, and doing this broadcast from a specialized facility uh, put out by the Boston Red Sox baseball team to help veterans with PTSD. 
you know, this is a tough subject. This this is a tough subject for you. You know, put the UFO side away for a second. Let's talk about what you're going through, what many veterans have gone through. Well, like I can talk about my personal situation. Um, So I'm a honorably discharged veteran um, and I've been diagnosed with uh, PTSD. Um, We, I served in Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom um during those campaigns we did launch hundreds of tomahawk missiles directly from my ship and um we you know seeing directly the damage uh and the carnage that was happening from those missiles and the tactics of the people that we were fighting um it really messes with you um seeing the bodies, seeing the, the children that died, seeing the collateral damage. But with all vets, we do our job. We get it done, and then we come home. Problem is, a lot of people suffer in silence. They go day to day. They get angry at that waitress, and they lose their temper, even though it was something stupid. They get angry at their family. They or they or they stay the opposite. They're scared to go out of their house. They're scared to do anything. They're scared to go grocery shopping. PTSD manifests itself in many many different ways. I'm currently in a two week PTSD extensive, very intensive treatment program called Home Base. It's located here in Boston, and I implore all of my fellow sailors, soldiers from any country, from Canada, from America, from New England. I don't know who qualifies for for this. I think it's only for American soldiers, but if it's not, look into it. But Or find a program that's similar. Don't suffer. There's help. There's tools. There's ways to cope. There's medications that may be able to help you. No medication is a cure, but there's a lot of coping mechanisms that I've learned over the last two weeks that have brought a lot of peace to my life. So I reach out to everybody that served, everybody that's had to be in the theater of war, and anybody that's had to cause the destruction of other human beings. Reach out for help. Do you think that a lot of people in your position take it more as a as a video game i mean i had heard i I had watched a documentary on a number of years ago regarding these drone pilots and they were actively recruiting the u.s air force and navy were actively recruiting you know people with high skills in video games because they would treat it more like a video game rather than the humanity of everything that you were going through. Now, at your point in time when you were doing this, I know you knew you had a job to do, and that was defending what you needed to defend. At any point, when did it hit you? When you're doing it, you think you're doing the right thing. You may still be doing the right thing. And even uh, there's been a recent uptick with drone pilots that are doing these hits, they're having a very, very, very high suicide rate. They're having problems, severe problems with PTSD. Um, They're not treating it like a video game. They may at first, just like me in my 20s, pushing a button or making sure computer works so we can fire our missiles and hoorah, another bunch of bad guys dead. And then you see a documentary five years later of somewhere you know your ship hit and there's women's bodies and children's bodies and then it hits you. Then you see the results. And and I think for people to understand, that's how you found out. That's how, that's how you found out. And I, and I see you welling up there a little bit. So I'm going to turn it down a little bit and I'll, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. So what Gary told me uh, after the, or before the show 
when we were talking about this because he really wanted to talk about PTSD and and for all veterans out there, it doesn't matter whether you're in the Canadian Armed Forces, the United States military, Australia, Great Britain, the UK, anywhere, you know, reach out. And that's kind of the purpose that we are talking about right now. But what Gary is saying is it never affected him until all of a sudden he watched this documentary and they were showing the Tomahawk missiles, but they never show you the actual launch at the time. They show you some stage launch, but they showed the targets. And when Gary put two plus two together, he realized that he was the dude who pressed the button on a lot of this destruction. And it, and he recognized the targets by the coordinates that he was given. Am I correct on that, Gary? Yeah, places our ship hit were all over Afghanistan. We were one of the ship, few ships that could always fire. So we were the go-to ship. So we had priority targets. We had, we had a lot of things, you know, and it, it was not a situation that, anybody really walks away from completely unscathed and my hat goes off to anybody that had to stand on the foot and look in the eyes of of their enemies. My, my plight sucks. So I know your plight sucks. Reach out, please get help home base and home base program in Boston, Massachusetts, mass general puts it on and it's funded by the U S by the Red Sox. You'll never find a more uh, a finer staff that cares, uh, a better bag of skills to learn to deal with cope with your PTSD, and it doesn't cost a penny out of your pocket. They pay for everything: airfare, food, lodging, everything. Just if you don't do this, reach out and get help in your local governments, magistrates, uh, counties, you know, whatever place you live reach out and get some help. How important is it, even if you can't find help, Gary, to at least keep talking? Yes. Um, If you can't find help, create your help. Start a group. Get in contact with old shipmates, old soldiers, people you trust. Talk about it. Learn to learn to deal with it because it'll just eat you up and you can't be the person that your family wants you to be unless you can learn to deal with this stuff and learn to cope. How are you doing? Me? Yeah. I'll be honest with you. Uh, two weeks ago, I wouldn't be just slightly tearing up. I'd be a wreck right now. I have learned a lot of valuable skill sets from home base that have helped me get a lot of inner peace. Uh, they've, you know, uh, I don't think I'll ever be whole, but you know what? I feel a lot better about myself, a lot better. Safe spaces help. Safe areas help. And knowing where you're comfortable helps. And You know, that's why I've always on this show thanked our veterans and and you've heard it. You've been in our chat room where I say this is always a safe place for veterans to speak and and talk. We need more of that out there and we need more conversations to let people just speak. That's the biggest way to get to help heal. When we talk about it, we can release it. Am I correct on that? Yeah, hey, talking about it definitely helps. And just remember, you know, no matter if you have a, a loved one that has PTSD, especially if it's, you know, combat related or war related, you you can't fix them. It's not a matter of what you can, no matter how much you want to try, you're not going to fix them. But you can be understanding and you can you can help them reach out. Help them yeah. with, you know, because my wife... She's the one that made me feel again. And I had turned off all my emotions for a long time. Gary, God bless you, man. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for supporting the vets and yourself with PTSD. Keep the message going. 
and good luck with UAPX. Coming up, hour number three of Spaced Out Radio. We continue right after this. We're clear, brother. Good job. Hey, appreciate you letting me uh, talk. No problem, man. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about, man. We yeah, love you here. Uh, it's uh, it's just sad. I, I've had uh, several people that I've served with, people that I know, you know, take their own lives too, and that's it. It's it's unfortunate. And, Mm-hmm. You gonna be able to sleep now? I'm gonna take some melatonin and try to. <laughs> well, the good news is you broke your record for the fewest swear words you've ever used on this show. I was trying. I was trying. We got a shit and we got an asshole. Uh, they happened within ten minutes apart of each other. Yeah. Uh... So, I do appreciate that. You know, you're getting lots of love in the chat room, man. Getting lots of love in the chat room. Make sure you check that out, you know, and your night on some positive, man. Cause that's, uh, oh. as someone who, as someone who suffers from depression and anxiety, it's these people in this chat room right here who allow me to sleep every night, man, <laughs> because of their kind words. Yeah, no, you always got a great group of people. Uh, you know, I can't. Uh, your 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 uh, your fandom is uh, a very positive one, which is reflects upon the host. <clears throat> if you weren't as positive as you were, they wouldn't be the way they are. Well, we do allow UFO Jane in here every now and again. <laughs> no, I'm teasing Jane. Oh, I'm teasing. She's awesome. I love, yeah, I love her. Yeah, me too. She's a sweetheart. She uh, she's hilarious. Uh, but, um, you know what, we, um, what's, what, there was only one shit and one asshole, Abe. I was listening. That's it. Man, well, that's going to be a record for me of all the, time. The commercial shits don't matter. If he says it during the break, it doesn't matter. Cause like, <laughs> I was trying like, to keep them just to, just to the breaks. <laughs> uh, and, and and here's a good one. Jessa just figured out that she is just she. Look at that. What's that? She figured it out. I, I don't know. She goes, I'm just me. She figured it out. Well, good. We should all figure that out. That's all you can Perfect. be is you. All right, brother. I got to go get ready for hour three here. All right, brother. You, you need, need to go get sleep. And uh, good luck to you, and uh, and we'll see you online, man. All right, man. We'll You're always up. when you can't sleep at night. Come in the chat room. We got people there for you. Roger that. Have a good one. All right, take care, Gary Voorhees, everybody. Thank you, Embers Para World. Appreciate that. <coughs> Excuse me. We got the fedora wearing, the fedora wearing John Hudson, coming up next. By the way, just want to say, uh, proud of my fellow Canadians right now. Proud of my fellow Canadians. I'm not going to go into detail why. Okay. Just proud of them. You can find it on Twitter. If you haven't seen it already. It's rock and roll. And uh, on the uh, Namibia cam, looking at Namibia right now, there are no animals at the watering hole outside of a couple of their grouse over there. And some more little birds. That's it.
we got about a minute here. <laughs> oh, Duke. You know them's fighting words, Duke. Uh, yes, you can, Jeremy. Yes, you can, and it's only getting worse there. Um... Uh, Well, Fabster, considering your head touches the tip of the 49th parallel, I would uh, not be surprised. Or it does surprise me. Bim Jim never talked grouse with Merle. There's no such thing as Canadian bacon. Hate to break your heart. We don't do Canadian bacon up here. Thank you, Murray. Michael times two, dry toast, magician, cat chaser, Smithy, and Simon for the amazing super chats tonight. It's a wonderful way to support what we do. Here we go with the third hour. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on Talk Stream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Fabacious. Fabacious is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as a clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website, spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. And on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. Now, let's head into the swamp where our main man, Swamp Dweller, from the YouTube channel Swamp Dweller, has another creepy tale for you. Hi, Spaced Out Radio listeners. This is Swamp Dweller. It's time for your nightly dose of spookiness on the show. If you have an interesting encounter or a spooky story that you would like to share, be sure to submit them in at swampdweller.net. You can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash swampdwellerreads. Now, let's chill out, relax, and together, let's enter the swamp. In the summer of 1987, I was a Fred Harvey employee at Grand Canyon National Park. So after my summer contract was up, I signed on to work over the winter for Fred Harvey. Right after New Year's Eve of 1988, I was moving into a company housing with my roommate. He was a very evangelical Christian guy named Dave. He was pretty weird and used to cast practically everybody except him into hell. He would stand in Missawak Lodge and pronounce that 98% of the people we could see were going to hell. But not him. Never him. After moving to company housing on the second floor and on the west end of the building facing the Grand Canyon, there was a knock at the door and I answered it. I found a deputy sheriff and two SWAT cops in full body armor. The deputy sheriff informed me that they had a crisis situation and we had to evacuate the building immediately. After putting on my boots and going outside, I saw a sharpshooter across the street on the balcony of another company housing for employees building. I could see him sighting something or someone, and then not anymore. They appeared to be on hold your fire stance for the moment. Freaking out and wondering, really wondering what's going on, Dave and I thought it was a major drug bust. Back in 1986 and 1987, if you didn't use drugs, you were in the strong minority. 
Everybody used recreational drugs at the Grand Canyon. And I mean everybody. That's why I and super religious Dave were roommates. Neither one of us used drugs. Dave used to, but he stopped and got sober and super religious. Everybody was going to hell but me and him, he was certain. Anyway, after leaving the building and seeing what I thought was a sharpshooter on hold your fire status, we went down to the end of the street, and since it was cold out, we were told that we could sit in the emergency police vehicles nearby. So Dave and I did, and we could hear the radio traffic going back and forth. As they were getting ready to storm one of the employee apartments in the building, we just evacuated, on orders. There was a roll call to see who was in position, and if they could see anything. Radio traffic kept coming back that it was negative. They couldn't see anything, and the sharpshooter didn't have a shot he could take, because the curtains were closed was why. Now, both of us were really, really freaking out, and wondering what the hell was going on. Super religious Dave thought that the devil was in control and maundering around the Grand Canyon. It was obvious, totally obvious. No kidding, I thought. You might be right, super religious Dave. This time, anyway. After roll call and everyone was in position, the sharpshooter came over the radio and said he still didn't have a shot. There was a countdown in the signal. Everybody in. It's a go. It's a go. Everybody in. And then, radio silence. Absolute radio silence. Not another word came over the radio for several long minutes. The devil was in control. It's clear. It's real clear. Super religious Dave was sure of it. No shit, I felt like saying. But it's super religious Dave, so I didn't want to curse or use profanity. Then I'd also be going to hell too. That would make it clear. Now, in conclusion, it was not a major drug bust at the Grand Canyon. Two employees at the time, of Fred Harvey, had kidnapped an 11-year-old girl in Phoenix brought her back up to the national park and were holding her in their room on the east side of the building and the floor below us. Me and super religious Dave were pretty freaked out. The police got the girl back, but one of the kidnappers had briefly gotten away and was on the run for a little while. Before he was captured, super religious Dave and I were shocked and surprised, but we adjusted to it. By the way, that happened right as I was taken at knife point, briefly, from one of my other employees in the residence by a drugged-up employee of Fred Harvey, who kept telling me that I needed to pay him $80. He needed $80, or he was going to stab me and cut my eyes out. I guess it's just another day at Grand Canyon National Park over the winter of 1987. Bad times at Grand Canyon National Park, but everybody ended up A-OK. All right. It's time to bring in the fedora, <clears throat> excuse me, the fedora wearing John Hudson returns for another edition of the Unbiased UFO Report. His hair is flowing, his chin hair is perfectly clothed, we're going to rock and roll this right now. How you doing, John? Pretty good, man. How about you? I am great. Great interview with Gary Voorhees. And yeah. get uh, yourself coming on in here, making things happen. And it's been a good day. It's been a very yeah, good day. Yeah, yeah not, that, that was that was crazy. And I just want to point out two quick things that, that Gary said I want to draw attention to. And that is one that, you know, no matter how much you love someone, um, PTSD or any one of these conditions is one that, that definitely needs for professional or you know some kind of you know outside help don't feel you can solve it yourself and don't put any pressure on yourself to do so it's the worst thing you can do for yourself you, you gotta just help them get help and don't put it on yourself to solve their problems for them and then the second thing is all about the importance of taking care of yourself there's a reason why on the airplane they tell you that you have to put your mask on first and then your kids it's because you'll pass out and then your kids will die so it's really important to take care of yourself. It's really important to do all those things first. And it's the same reason why taking care of yourself and actually putting yourself first isn't selfish. It's actually a favor to everyone around you because they want you at their, at your best. And if you're not at your best, then you're not actually being yourself to everyone around you. So what Gary said is, is incredibly important. Put your air mask on. It's all that matters. Put it on. It works. All right. Let's get right to it. And let's, uh, we're going back into the isotopes 
Yes, because I I think I have something for you, Dave. I think I have something that's going to help. Okay. So, are, are you ready? Not really. This one's caught me off guard a little bit because, okay. you know, science and me I know. are like oil and water. I know. I, I felt bad the other night because I tried to keep it real simple for time, and I realized I simplified it so much that I possibly made it more confusing than it even needed to be. So I want to offer some clarity. Okay? All right. Okay. So, let's give it a try. The, the one thing, the only one thing you got to keep in mind before I give you this example is, is that if you look at at two isotopes of the same element, so you have an element like lithium, and you have two isotopes of it, they have the same number of protons, they have the same number of electrons, I believe in every case, but they, they what they have different is this different number of, of neutrons. And it's the neutrons that are the difference, okay? And neutrons do have a very, very light mass, so there, there is an impact. To give you an example of why this is a big deal and why the whole idea of a periodic table, the way we grew up with it, is so kind of bizarre because there's so much more to it is they did an experiment where they took two isotopes of lithium and they gave them these two isotopes of lithium to uh, mice that were nursing. Okay. One isotope of lithium caused the mice to overfeed their young. The other isotope of lithium caused them to not feed their young. Exact same lithium. The only difference was it was two different isotopes of the same element. And that's why isotopes are so important. And to give you an idea of, of how, what we use it for, aside from like explosives, is this is how we do tracers uh, in the body for tracing uh, certain um, uh, medical problems. Um, it's also used in certain uh, cancer killing elements. And uh, it's also uh, isotopes are also used for tracking um, uh, bad currency. Um, and so it is something that we use as well. It's not something that that uh, that only the the aliens use. So come on, a little bit helpful. Not at all. In one oh, ear, out the other. Oh come In on, ear, out dude. I'm Wu. You're who, what, where, when, why, and how. I'm one word. You're six. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. Well, hopefully, hopefully, one of you, one at least one or two of you, uh, found found some uh, found some clarity in, in what I just offered. Um, the only isotopes so, I know are the Springfield isotopes, minor oh league goodness. baseball team. My goodness, my goodness. Okay, all right. Okay, on to other news. On to other news. Jacques Vallée sold his soul. Did he? To whom? To um, to uh, Avi Loeb, essentially. <laughs> um, so uh, I I totally just I um, while well, I, I agree with a lot of the reasons you've given, um, I really see the Galileo project as um, something that needs to be supported at some level by everybody, and so um, so I, I I think at some level this is a good thing, especially if Jacques Vallée can provide some some um, uh, real value to it. But I did find it a little bit funny um, that this was coming out after, you know, the other conversations that we've all been having over the previous weeks and months uh, as each person has announced that they've been joining the Galileo project. And we've all been like, oh, no, not another one, you know, and then and then here comes um, uh, Jacques Vallée, you know, with with this announcement. But all in all, my personal opinion is, is I, I think it's I think it's a good thing. You know what this is reminding me of? Were you a wrestling fan back in the early 2000s? No. When the New World Order bit. came out. When no, the New no, World no. Order came out, you know, Kevin Hall or uh -uh. Scott Hall and Kevin Nash came out as the Wolf Pack, started the New World Order. Their first recruit was Hulk Hogan, getting him to come from the good side over to the dark side where he became Hollywood Hulk Hogan, dropped the Real American theme song, and go went with a Jimi Hendrix voodoo child, right? <laughs> and then they just started wow. recruiting everybody. Everybody. Lex Luger, Macho Man, Randy Savage, you know, Buff Bagwell, everybody. They were recruiting everybody. And it got to the point where it just got ridiculous. That's what the Galileo Project reminds me of right now. <laughs> totally. Totally. The who's who? Let's join the Galileo Project. 
This is yeah, like no, UFO NWO. That is the hashtag that we're going to make a T-shirt for. UFO NWO for life. There you go. There you go. There you go. No, it's, it's hard, right? Because, I mean, how much value can all these people add? At the same time, if any of them can bring anything unique to the table, my, by all means. I mean, like, let's support Avi. I mean, like, he, it's a good project, right? But it, it is hard. It is it is a little bit hard to um, to digest, you know, just in light of, you know, just all the things that have been going on. And, and uh, you know, it's been a little hard. Okay. So what does Avi Loeb bring to the Galileo project? You mean oh, what is valet? Uh, uh, well, I don't know what Avi Loeb. What, what do you think? What do you think Avi Loeb brings? I, I think he's bringing sorry. money. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I meant Jacques Valet. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, um, well, I mean, I mean, the thing is, is that um, you know, my okay. So my guess is what they see him as his value as being is his reputation, flat out. I mean, he is he is hands down the most famous scientist on earth at, at least for historically that hasn't been involved in the ufo program right so uh in, in the phenomenon at all right so so bringing him on board it's essentially like hiring that that guy from from uh, you know uh, 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 the third kind movie right that the character was based on right i mean it's hiring the guy right so there's a huge pr aspect of it for them right i mean and let's face it he's a damn good scientist it's amazing how brilliant he is, you know, considering how long he's been doing this for and so forth. And, um, and so to me, you know, having him on board, you know, makes a lot of sense. But as far as like, you know, what he, you know, what is he really going to bring? Well, what he really should bring to them is his database skills. <laughs> That's really what he should bring to them. What, what he really should bring to them is his ability to build very, very complex databases that handle lots and lots and lots and lots of different completely bizarre data types. That's what he's really, really good at. And that's what I would like to see him bring to that project. But I don't know what they actually think. I don't, I don't know what, and, and I don't, I, my guess is, is what he actually does, what they think he's going to do, and what he thinks he's going to do are three completely different things. With the star-studded lineup that the Galileo Project now has, from very high-quality names in this field to some questionable, and you know what, I'll even throw Lou Elizondo in that questionable category at this point, and with Seth Stoshak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, hold on. No, I know, yeah. no, I know you're. No, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'm just kidding. I know what you're saying. There's still a lot of controversy around him. Is oh, what yes. I'm saying. Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, and let's face it, anytime you bring in anyone who's who's not, um, it doesn't have to be an academic, but but who doesn't have a science background, you got you have to justify it at some level, you know? Well, I mean, that's the lobbying that comes involved, lobbying for money for this project. It's pretty easy to lobby for money when you got the, got the guy who allegedly ran the program. Mm -hmm. That's who people with millions of dollars to spend want to talk to they don't want to talk to valet okay they don't want to talk to avi Loeb because they're going to get the the very high intellect conversation they want the boots on the ground person who's running chasing after these things to say yes they're real hmm. that's where it makes sense that's why seth stoshak does not make sense i'm still hmm. anti-seth stoshak on this list i really am but I don't get a say. I don't get a, 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 a purpose of that. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, yeah I, I agree. I agree. Question. I should actually yeah. get to my question rather than just sitting there at the end of a paragraph with a period instead of a question mark. So the question mark is, considering that the Galileo Project has brought in some very interesting and significant names along with some controversial names, does this help the credibility of of the project in moving forward with someone like Jacques Vallée, who is well into his 80s and still going strong, but let's face it, he's on the downside of his career. Um, yeah, no, I, I uh, yeah, no, don't agree. Um, uh, because essentially, once again, so okay, so realize I come, I come at Jacques Vallée from a from a very different angle than most people right because i live in silicon valley right so i knew about him outside of the kind of the ufo thing right 
And, and so to me, to me, what, you know, I mean, cause let's face it, like what he did for, for other projects, right. For some very important projects is he designed the database. He's the one that was able to come up with the database schema with all this, with all the structure, with all the, with all the, the ability to actually handle, you know, a, a, I mean, they, they did a, for, for, um, for a tip, they ended up with 11 distinct databases that you had to then bring together into some sort of a unified reporting. I mean, like, oh man. And Jacques Vallée, like, I mean, he's been doing databases since the beginning of time. I mean, the guy's a freaking wizard at it. And so to me, like, that's, that, I mean, that's what I would hire him for. To me, like, that, that's a skill set he can bring that probably no one else in the entire Galileo project has, has any clue about. Not at his level. Will he bring money? Does he still have that kind of pull? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And he can bring international. Well, not that, Gal not that Galileo will have any trouble with international money, but he can bring money from different places. He can bring money from from um, non traditional academic, non traditionally academic frontiers, and so forth. And and the thing is, is that let's face it. You know, anytime anytime you have anyone who someone else might just want a chance to meet. They might just want to have a chance to talk to them, you know, at a cocktail party, right? Then boom, you know, they're, they're a valuable person from when it comes to shareholding, uh, um, fundraising. Very true. Very true. We got a couple minutes to go here. We'll finish it out with Jacques Vallée here joining the Galileo Project. This does give, on a positive note, the Galileo Project, a real one-two punch when it comes to historic figures regarding this. Avi Loeb, obviously, is the newer one, you know, as he put his career and reputation on the line with, with the Oumuamua, and then, of course, going into the past with Jacques Vallée. Now, look, there are brilliant people on this team, brilliant people. But if you're looking for scientific name recognition that's going to really pump the subject, it, it does add a nice one-two punch to everything. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And and another thing that I should add that isn't a benefit to Galileo, but is a benefit to all of us, and that is that there are many, many people being brought into this project that would not normally have worked together, would not normally have crossed paths, would not normally have ended up on the same email list, in the same meetings, in the same, you know... So, and now they're going to be. And so this is going to build at least two or three friendships that never existed before and wouldn't have existed if not for this kind of coming together of people. And very often those friendships net significant results. What kind of results are we looking for now? Like, do we need to stack the team anymore or do we have to continue stacking or, or continue adding pieces to this puzzle before we can start looking for the findings. No, I would say from a long time ago, all we really needed was data and that's all we ever needed. And that's all we ever are going to need. It's all about the data. The problem is, is that getting the, um, getting the capital to um, get the right instrumentation up there to, to generate all that data is, is I think the, the more pressing problem. And so I think if, if from that point of view, yes, then someone like ballet, you know, is definitely going to help when it comes to raising money and, and, you know, could help, you know, um, you know, crossover. I mean, quite honestly, you know, I mean, I've been in situations where, um, you know, we just need to bring one person on just to get access to some funding. That's a big one. Money drives everything. Money drives everything. The fedora wearing John Hudson will continue with the unbiased UFO report when we return and i'll uh, continue with it what the heck <laughs> why not John seems like a nice guy. i might as well go for it i mean we are talking ufos tonight not friggin isotopes peace out no radio continues right after this we'll be right back Hey, bud, I'm just going to run uh, Doug Stevenson outside, okay? 
No problem. You you have fun, Doug. Be right back. Come on, Doug Stevenson. <coughs> Darth Fedora. I like that. <laughs> it's isotopes. It's what for breakfast. <laughs> you know, I, I'll be honest. Part of the reason why I, I find isotopes so, so exciting um, it has nothing to do with any UFOs. It has to do with the fact that it's just yet another glowing, glaring example that like everything that I was taught in school was wrong with the exception of like math <laughs> is pretty much it, right? Yeah, pretty much. And I mean, think about like the periodic table. Like we were, we, we put so much weight in that periodic table. Turns out, mm -mm, not really accurate. You really need a table with all the isotopes of every single element on it because each one of them might actually interact differently. That's messed up, but it's super cool. Well, thank you, Jess. I appreciate that. You got to stay curious. And like I said before, I really encourage everyone to listen to this interview because um, one, um, the woman who's interviewing him, um, I don't know what nationality she is, but um, she's definitely not American. And um, she asks some very interesting questions. And um, she, you can really kind of glean from her questions, like what her concerns are. You know, it was actually, it was very interesting. And, um, and because English wasn't her first language, she didn't actually talk a whole lot. And so for the most part, it's just Gary Nolan explaining what he's doing. So it's a really, it's a, it's a very, very valuable interview to listen to. You know, I, I, uh, as far as that, that copper, um, uh, UFO, I, I, I didn't hear it. I didn't, I didn't hear Preston talk about it. So I, I need to go back and listen to it. Um, you know, the problem is, is that even if you saw what appeared to be a copper UFO, that doesn't mean it's actually made out of copper. I mean, I hate to say that, right? Cause I mean, you'd like to think that, you know, perception is, is somehow reality, but the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, I have no idea what, you know, just because it looks like it's made out of copper, even if it looks like it's made out of metallic, it doesn't matter. It doesn't. It doesn't mean it's actually copper. So you can't necessarily infer any any behavioral characteristics that copper might bring with it, just because it looks like copper. You know, and unless you got like a sample of it, and then you can say, "Oh, look, it's copper." The UFO is hanging up. It makes it sound like like the UFOs are like like slumming it. Like, you know, like these are the UFOs like didn't get, get to, didn't make it into college. So they like hang out like by the mining, you know, place and like smoke cigarettes and get in trouble. <coughs> Sorry. Just talking about hoodlum UFOs. Mm. Hoodlum UFOs? Yes. We have those? Yes. Yes. Okay. They're, they're those UFOs that hang out on the wrong side of town. Oh. <coughs> God, I hate Wednesdays. <coughs> My voice always hits me on a Wednesday. That is always. That is fascinating, Dave. I can't like I really wanna I really wanna like dig into that problem. That's really interesting. Why Wednesday? 
Because I talk all day, man. I know, but you talk all day every day. Yeah. So why Wednesday? I have a career. Not Sunday. Wednesday. Because when, Saturday and Sunday, I barely talk. True. And Thursdays, okay. I have the so, day off. Okay. So okay, so it's the, day, it's the day before your day off. Gotcha. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate it. want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with Fedora wearing John Hudson and the Unbiased UFO Report, speaking with Jacques Vallée. Him and Gary Nolan have a paper coming out, and... What you got on this, John? Yeah, so this is very cool. So the paper, the paper is actually already out. Um, it came out a couple weeks ago, and um, the the thing that um, that Gary said in the in this interview, which I thought was very very exciting, was that um, in the weeks after the publication of of the paper, um, he was approached by um, some people from the, from the government. And um, they basically uh, said that they were, you know, impressed with his work, and they were specifically impressed with his, his, the way he handled his research when it came to this topic, um, his, his, his um, resistance to coming to conclusions, and his ability to communicate his his results, and um, and they actually inquired whether he would want to um, to actually help out. And so he might actually be engaging um, with with elements of of um, of this organ of this uh, uh, UAP organization uh, at a professional level. The money that is trying to be raised here is this private money or government money? No. So this 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 is another cool topic. So um, so basically, Gary is uh, sorry, Doctor Nolan uh, is is basically doing what everyone should be doing and that is instead of thinking about who did the legislation pass it's oh wait that means there's funding Ooh, how do you get that funding and what can you do with that funding that's what that's the way to go and that's exactly what gary's doing so what dr nolan dr gary nolan is doing is saying look wait a second now that there is this um you know this i gotta look it up because I, I mess it up every time i try to remember it this aoi msg group um I got to go up a good acronym, a good, a good uh, sentence for that one. Um, the, now that this group exists, that now he has two things. One, he has a group that he can go to to actually inquire about other parts, right? So there's lots of other crashes that he's heard of, lots of other um, places where material has been recovered that he's heard of that he hasn't had any been able had any luck getting access to. So he's hoping to be able to use this office as a conduit for basically exchanging and and acquiring other parts to test, which I think is a very, very cool and a very logical way to use them. Uh, the second thing, which is what you're talking about, is that there, there will be funding as well with this, and they will be able, and individual groups or companies or whatever will be able to apply for that funding. And so basically what this means is that Gary One will hopefully be able to recover a little of money that he's personally spent. I was personally quite shocked to find out that he believes that he's, he's actually dropped about 70 grand of his own money um, on, on this testing. But more importantly, there is a new um, scope that he wants to build that will shed a, a very different light on what we're talking about. It'll be extremely expensive to build and he needs a lot of money to do so. And so he's hoping to be able to um, raise money through this uh, UAP fund 
to further his research and, and allow other people to take advantage of his gear. How much money did he put in of his own? 70 grand about. Wow. He must, he must really, really be into something big. If he's willing to dig into his own pocket. Well, I mean, keep in mind that, that, that Dr. Nolan, he, he's, he's, he's not, he's not your typical Stanford professor. <laughs> Gary special, special kid. And the special kid, he's already spun out four separate companies from the research in his laboratory. So the, the fundamental research he's done in his laboratory has resulted in four separate companies being, being produced. And he's, you know, basically is founder of all those companies. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's done very well for himself. Okay, but the majority that mean of that, that, that seventy grand should be out of his pocket. All I'm saying is that he he probably a lot more like will he's a lot more likely to have that that, that resources than someone else. Okay, so the fact that he has put seventy grand in his own out of his own pocket to study the UFO phenomena and what is going on with that. You know, is there a chance that he could ever recoup that? Well, yeah, absolutely. And that's the other thing that, that he could do through this, through this, um, through this, fun, through these funds is, you know, now, now the truth of the matter is, is that he'll tell himself, I, I know how this works. He'll tell himself, oh, look, uh, they just sent me $200,000. I dropped 70 grand before. So now that's paid back and we got 130 grand to, to spend on stuff. But what will end up happening is he'll end up spending the full 200 grand on gear and he won't actually get his 70 grand back. That's how this works. That's just how labs are. I guess that's what happens when when you literally are are in love with what you are studying. Absolutely. And you are only ever going to get good at anything you love. Anything you hate, you will never become as good at as you want to be. It's kind of like when podcasting, you John. All you do is throw money into it. <laughs> you know, just hope. Hope, <laughs> just hope. hope and hope. All right. Final topic for you tonight. Uh, government paper published that the U.S. Gov has reached out to Dr. Nolan. Does this yeah, go along so, the same line? Yeah. So, so basically, no, no, no. The, the, uh, since this paper was published, the, the government has reached out to him and, um, uh, and acknowledged his good work uh, in his unbiased approach. And uh, they, they specifically like the way he communicates the, his results and so forth, which which I I completely agree. I mean, you look at the way he's handled some of these topics, and he's handled some very very emotionally volatile samples, and he's done a beautiful job of just playing such a clean line to it. He's he's really it, it, it's very admirable the way his approach to science. It really is. Right. Okay. So. I, I need more than that, though, man. Because oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I apologize. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I apologize. So I, I alluded to it before, so that's 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 where I'm, 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 I don't want to repeat myself. But what it comes down to is, is it, is that is that what we have is we have, um, uh, and he he believed that they were, I believe he said he thought that they were CIA. I don't know if that was confirmed or not. Um, but basically, what it came down to is that in the weeks after the pub the the paper with Jacques, with Jacques Vallée was published. People from the U.S. government reached out to Dr. Gary Nolan and and invited him to start engaging with them on future projects. So what we're talking about is essentially what what, what that essentially means is that um, the, the potential exists for for Gary to uh, for Dr. Nolan to be taking on. A, a a similar kind of spokesman type role that like say Lou Elizondo's had. Would he have to leave his job at Stanford for that? Well he wouldn't. So no. <laughs> I mean No, but it, I, I, I think this opens up a lot of curious minds though, John, because as this progresses and if the Galileo project, for instance, has any success, obviously the United States 
government in in one fashion or another is going to try and piggyback off of that. And if they went and offered somebody like like Gary Nolan to head up a department for that, that would make sense. Uh, yeah, well, uh, certainly in a lot of situations, yes. It, in, in the case of Dr. Gary Nolan, I don't agree. Um, basically, um, uh, it, it, it is, they are the Nolan labs. Uh, he has 30 full-time researchers on staff in his lab doing work for him. It's a magnificent setup. It's one of the best I've ever heard of. Um, I, I'm intensely jealous. Um, so yeah, it's possible. I think it's very unlikely because one of the things he, he talks about in his interview is the fact that as much as he does love all this, this stuff, this is all done in his free time. This is not his real job. He has a real job. He's just lucky enough to be able to be working in the field where the equipment and methods that he uses for his normal job are the same types of, of devices and techniques that he's developing that are useful when it comes to researching UAP debris. Well, let's hope he gets more. Let's, let's hope he gets more. And Absolutely. this came across my email here. Totally, I know you're not prepared for this, but apparently, as reported by Christopher Sharp of the Liberation Times, uh, Robert Panotti, no, president of ICER, the International Coalition for Extraterrestrial Research, has met with San Marino's two heads of state to discuss Project Titan, a proposal that would see San Marino make an historic UN, U, United Nations request for the creation of a periodic UFO UAP conferences under its aegis. So this has been um, this has been in play for a while now. Um, I first caught wind of this when Elizondo first went there um, uh, several months ago. I remember when that was, but that was it was it was when it was when the report came out. So it was several months ago. Um, talking about the fact that. The, the one that the the big play that they had um, that that local village was that they basically wanted to take this conference that they have and and basically parlay that like turn that into a a bid to be the home base for the UN UFO representative organization so basically having an official organization within the UN for UAPs and have that be based in San Marino. And so that was, now I don't know how realistic that is. I don't know how far along that is, but, but that, that is, I believe what this is alluding to. And this is what I heard was the game plan like four months ago. It's just, it's My a long-term game plan. I want to say a big thank you, John, for another successful edition of the unbiased UFO report. Absolutely fantastic. And I will hope and pray to my God above that we never talk isotopes again. <laughs> we'll get you there, buddy. We'll get you there. We'll get you there. So thank you everyone for hanging out. And hopefully, hopefully at least one of you found value in it. So thank you much, everyone. Isotopes, people. Let's get to Shirky Poo's <laughs> news. I can guarantee you tonight's news has nothing to do with isotopes. But it does start off with a little bit of time travel. A so-called time traveler claiming to be from 2028 has shared a video claiming he's been alone in a post-apocalyptic world for 340 days. TikTok user Javier who goes by the handle of at Unico, so Breviviente, pardon me, translates to only survivor, go figure, first posted about his supposed life in the future in February last year, recording the Spanish city of Valencia when it was completely empty. Since then, he claims to have visited a number of unusual or usually heavy cities, including Barcelona, Madrid, and Seville, 
and they were all empty with eerie silence as well. So how does this continue on? Well, some 11 months after his first video, Javier says he is still alone, having spent the past 340 days stranded trying to find human life. Day 340 alone in the world. I have toured cities and many more, he captioned. What could be happening to me? In another video, Javier showed followers as he visited a museum in his home city that is usually full of people. The footage shows him waking up or walking up to a deserted staircase and exploring the empty rooms. In another film, a reflection of himself in a building but does not show his face, while one clip shows him standing alone on a beach. Many people, of course, commented to question Javier's claims, with some left wondering if he used some sort of video editing techniques to create the illusion of him being alone. Yep. Others have also asked why he still has access to electricity and internet connection if he's by himself with no one else in the world. One said, cool trick, man. I can also do the same now with after the decades of effects that have come through and remove the plug-in. Beautiful places, though. Someone else wrote, it's edited because I could see the mouse of the computer, which means he has edited the video and screen records from a computer, but is very, very talented. I don't think the guy's a time traveler. Speaking of space, octopuses are apparently from space. Yeah, go figure. That's why we got UAP underwater. It's because of the octopuses. So how do we get here? It's actually a main part of an argument behind a research paper published in an actual peer-reviewed journal. Paper was published in the journal Progress in Biophysics and Molecular Biology titled Cause of the Cambrian Explosion, Terrestrial or Cosmic. Paper digs deeper into the origin of life on Earth. As a result, it posits that life began thanks to a rain of retroviruses, which literally fell from space. Those retroviruses then added a new DNA sequence and sequences to terrestrial genomes, which the paper said further drove mutagenic change including octopuses. Yep, this is where things get interesting. Paper starts to discuss the arrival of cephalopods. The paper itself claims that certain cephalopods, like octopuses, squid, and others arrived on the planet by falling from space, frozen in a kind of stasis. Thus, the possibility that cryopreserved squid and or octopus eggs arrived in icy boldides surrounded by, uh, you know, several hundred million years, and this should not be discounted as a theory. The idea that life originated beyond Earth isn't exactly a new one. Yeah, as Stephen Fleischfresser points out in a 2018 paper, the theory of panspermia has been around since ancient Greece. However, this is perhaps one of the first times we've seen scientists claiming that octopus may be zeta reticulin or somewhere else. There's nothing better than going to a hockey game and seeing a teddy bear toss, because Lord knows there isn't any good fights anymore. The Pennsylvania team, their teddy bear toss set a new record when fans tossed over the boards 52,341 stuffed bears onto the ice. The Hershey Bears of the AHL held the teddy bear toss after uh, the first goal was scored against the Hartford Wolf Pack, the event called on spectators to throw teddy bears on the ice, all of them to be donated. Love it. If you have never seen this before, it is the most incredible sight. All the toys, by the way, 52,000 plus, donated to the county's children and youth, Cocoa Packs, Boys and Girls Clubs, Autism Societies, and the Children's Miracle Network in Hershey. This is what it's all about. Honestly, fantastic. That's why I love hockey, people. Moving on, this is one of those this-never-happens-to-me type stories. A wood and wicker chair purchased from a thrift store in Britain has been auctioned off for more than 21 grand when it was identified as the work of an early 20th century artist Auction House Swarters said a woman bought a chair for like seven bucks at the local thrift store. 
When she got the chair home, she had a closer look, thought it looked really interesting, emailed some pictures to the V&A Museum, but had no response. Her next step was Swarters. She emailed the design to specialist John Black. He responded immediately. Black recognized the chair as the 1902 work of Austrian artist Coleman Mosier. Black consulted a specialist on the Vienna Secession who confirmed his identification of the chair. Mosier, a teacher at the Vienna School of Applied Arts, designed the chair as a modern reinterpretation of a traditional 18th century ladder back chair at the auction house. Well, her seven bucks turned into $21,874.12. That stuff like literally never happens to me. And finally, a Minnesota police officer's badge has been returned to his department 127 years after he was killed in the line of duty. Hastings Police Chief Brian Schaefer said Officer Albert Jacobson became the department's only officer ever to be slain in the line of duty when he was shot and killed while pursuing a burglary suspect back in 1894. They only got one person in custody, and they had encountered the second one, a foot pursuit ensued and the suspect turned around and fired some gunshots at Albert and his partner. Schaefer said he met Gloria Hogenstein, Jacobson's great-granddaughter, in 2017, and she gave him what is now the department's only photo of the slain officer. Schaefer said Hogenstein reached out to him a few weeks ago to give him the badge as well. Hogenstein said a second cousin had found the badge while going through a chest in her attic. What can you say? This is a piece of 130-year-old history for the town very cool very cool when that stuff happens all right big thank you to shirky poo for the incredible news thank you to the fedora wearing john hudson who has more isotopes inside of him than most people have underwear in their drawers and of course to mr swamp dweller and gary Voorhees for coming on the show to make it a fun fun time tonight we got mr ron bumblefoot thaw rocking in the background with little brother is watching bumblefoot is the official music of spaced out radio rocking us in and out of every single show get your horns up for the guitar god himself special thanks to everybody listening in at home at work in your cars wherever you may be thank you to everyone in our chat rooms tonight YouTube, Twitch, Elgab, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. We done. We done. Come on. Hit that X. Hit that X. There we go. And there's the fedora wearing John Hudson. What's up, my man? How you doing, sir? That's what he does. He wears fedoras. Got a couple of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Download this. <clears throat> I tell you, if I had a political talk show, I would be going until all hours of the night tonight. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic. Really oh, is. So bad for you. Oh, so we got a revolution happening here right now, dude. We got a really cool revolution happening right now. Hmm. That's a good thing. It's fantastic. Uh, the reason why I don't is because I like my channel. <laughs> That's why I like my channel. And I don't need to get flagged. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yes, we see bears in Canada. Bear legs, bear bums, bear backs. Mm hmm. All I will say is that there's one moron who can stop it, but he's too stupid to do so. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I think if you had a little more, you know, passion for it, you know, it might be worth doing the show, but considering, you know, how, you know, just, you know, lexidaically you are about it, you know, yeah, probably doing the right thing. Yeah. I do not have any aliases on Twitter. Like, there's people out there who have two, three, four, 25 profiles. I only have two profiles. I have, we have the spaced out radio one that I'm mostly on, and then I have my personal one. I have one or two that I can't get into at the moment because I can't remember their passwords. <laughs> yeah. But if I had an alias, I would be going all over. All over this stuff right now. I would. I'd be taking on stupidity left, right, and center. Ah, yes, because that always ends so well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes... Sometimes, though, John, the silly and the and and those who don't know how to use proper punctuation shouldn't be allowed on social media. That's my thoughts, right? Is there anything worse than when you see somebody on social media and they're in a rant and they can't figure out there, there, and there? <laughs> or when they're typing, they capitalize the, the first letter of every word? Well, you know, hey, that, brother, that one... That one's hard for me though because sometimes, sometimes I, I I must admit I think it looks better like not not the not like the and like but sometimes I think it does look better to capitalize certain words, so I, I can relate to that one a teeny bit. Love me, man. But you know the thing no. the thing for me is it is that I'm just I. I'm just I'm 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 getting to a point where I I've just I've lost. I've lost interest with language structure. You know, like as far as I'm concerned, language is just, a, it's a box of Legos and however people want to shove them together to make it work, as long as they can understand each other, ding, ding, ding. Guess what? You win. You know, I mean, it's like, like I you love all the words that like Oxford you keeps adding word. to their dictionary. You use the word bay in your vocabulary, don't you? Use the word what? Bay. Hey, bay. bay. Yeah. No, I've never even heard that before. B-A-E. Vin Man, you're still awake. <clears throat> I've never even heard that. I've never even heard of that before. What does it mean? Hold on. Let me laugh at Vin Man's comment. <laughs> oh, my God, dude. Just right over the bow right there, eh, Vinster? Mm -hmm. Mark Rademacher with a massive super sticker right there. 
Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you, Mark Rademacher. Vin, we should have hopped in the... Uh, I should have flown to Winnipeg. We could have hopped in the uh, Challenger and went for a ride, man. Donald Stevens, welcome back. What's up, Donald? You're still trying to figure out the whole bay thing, aren't you? Yeah, I actually never heard. I didn't know that was slang for baby. That's funny. Excaliperful, what's happening? Justin S. Hey, my bay, what's going on? Look at Fap. Look at this Canadian teaching us English. How many people out there think that FAP has a total of zero t-shirts that are free of stains? Hmm. I'm telling you, I honestly believe that our good friend FAP, who is a very, very positive and loving wrench around here, as zero t-shirts that do not have stains on them. That's my opinion. <clears throat> and I will wait for the reply. <laughs> I think that's brilliant. I do. Fab, damn, going in, going, <laughs> going in hard. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. That is good stuff. <clears throat> well, it could be anything from tacos to cereal to uh, caramel, whatever. Anything he wants. I think there's a lot of drool there at night. Fat looks like a drooler. <laughs> Just saying. <clears throat> uh, Steam Train Mark is letting us know, John. That we are alive later on today, slash tomorrow. Oh, I lost that bet. I mean, man, I want it again. <clears throat> are, are, are you are you by any chance watching the new the new Boba Fett series? No. Oh man, it's really good. Dude, I barely have time to take a shower, let alone oh, trust, watch television. Trust me, dude. I, I watch I watch probably I watch probably two hours of content like that a week. Maybe. Usually maybe like maybe it's like one or two hours a week, something like that. Um so if I get lucky, I'll get in like half an hour a day. You know, on like, you know, like if I have like a slow week, but, um, ah, but shit. that's why it's so important to me. If I'm going to do it, I, I, I watch stuff that I really enjoy. What'd you do? I forgot to edit the swear words out of these ones. Hold on. Thanks, Gary Voorhees. Yeah, jerk. I love the man, but. Mm. So we, can on. you go back and do it or? Yeah, I got to do it right now. Hold on. Uh, what's my time? 942. So 36, 46, 56, that's 42. Be around right here. Yeah, you, yeah. I saw the better video that you never got to see. I got the 10-minute video that, you know, it, 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 did, it basically was the same video, but you also got to see it turn, you got to see a side view of it. You, It still didn't have a very clear defined where you could see the little legs that Fravor was talking about, but you see dark spots where those were. It was twice the resolution of the Tic Tac video. So I'd say that I, I can stand as a witness to what happened that day. Are you surprised at the world? No. Why wouldn't there be? I mean, this is 
an extraordinary thing. It's it's, it's, it's something that unless you personally witnessed it, you know, it's just it's just like you know how I deal with any phenomenon that I've not witnessed. I'm try to be very polite to anybody, but I'm a skeptic to just about everything until I personally witness it. Do I think things are highly probable? Yes or no? It all depends. It depends on the person, depends on the situation. And I'm not surprised that this scares the shit out of people. There it is. Because if this is real, it means that this scares the shit out of people. Because if this is shit out of people. Although I got to say, man, that was a, that was a very a appropriate, appropriate place shit. to use it. Yeah, I know that. I don't want to cut it out, but I have no choice. Scares the shit out of people. Scares the shit out of people. Because if this is real, works. the shit out of people. Because if this is real, the shit out of people. Yeah, maybe I better trim that off a little bit more. Yeah. This scares the shit out of people. Because if this is real, it means that a lot of things that you may think right, are so not true. Go. Ten minutes later. So getting back to you and Kevin Day. So and Kevin, who's more. really uh, been affected Ooh. by this, which he has taken personal criticism on from many people in the UFO yeah. world trying to say, how can you have PTSD over watching videos? 52. You know, you started UAPX. Why both of you? Uh, because we wanted to work with that. I can't wait to go out and do again. It was very public ways with, with an, a few click. That was initiated by me. Uh, I particularly had a very, very, very strong distaste for a particular person that was in our company. Um, and I didn't agree with actions that he did. And from then on, I then went to the rest of the company and, and they agreed and we removed him. And then there was another, another situation where, you know, people come and go. You, you just got to keep moving forward. Uh, it's a company like any other. We're going to have people come. We're going to have people go. We're going to take hits. We're going to not take hits. We're going to, you know, that's just how it is. Okay. You've also taken a lot of criticism uh, about teammates that you do have on, on their online persona. Have you nipped that in the butt? <laughs> uh, as best as I can. Uh, he's still an asshole. <laughs> Excuse me if I can't. You nip that in the butt on their online. Can't. Uh, he's still an asshole. <laughs> it's amazing. Oh. It's amazing they allow. Please out. leave that one in there, please. I can't. <laughs> oh, I hold on. I think he's still an asshole. That works. <laughs> Excuse me, I can't say that, but he'll know exactly who I'm talking. All right, so resave that. <laughs> All right. In my well, book, Gary, one. you never swore through that whole episode because the two times you did do it were absolutely perfect places to do right. it, man. 42 should be like right here. Since we've been denied, you know, any collaborative footage other than that small Tic Tac video. And since we couldn't get it from the government, we decided to go get it ourselves. Um, you know, it started as a pipe dream. Then, you know, now it actually is a reality. So, it didn't even occur to us that we couldn't do this, that, you know, this, this just seemed to be the next natural step in the evolution of us, you know? Um, and as for PTSD from seeing a video, if you see a video that shouldn't be in existence and do things that shouldn't be able to be done, it kind of breaks your psyche. Uh, sorry to tell people. <laughs> Same. Well, I remember Kevin when I a phenomenon that I've not witnessed. Right it was twice the resolution of the tick. I criticism. Stand no, why wouldn't there be? I mean, this is an extraordinary thing. It's 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 something that unless you personally witnessed it, you know, it's just it's just like you know how I deal with any phenomenon that I've not witnessed. I'm try to be very polite to anybody. But I'm a skeptic to just about everything until I personally witness it. Do I think things are highly probable? Yes or no? It all depends. It depends on the person, depends on the situation. And I'm not surprised that this scares the shit out of people. 
depends on the situation. A skeptic, surprised that this scares the shit out of the shit out of people. The shit out of people, because if this is real, it means that yeah, right a lot of things that affected what you. And they're getting down to the nitty gritty now, and they're putting us on lockdown. With that was initiated by me, we agreed, and we removed them. And then there was another another situation where, you know, people come and go. You, you, you just got to keep moving forward. Uh, it's a company like any other. We're going to have people come. We're going to have people go. We're going to take hits. We're going to not take hits. We're going to, you know, that's just how it is. Okay. You've also taken a lot of criticism. Uh, as best as I can. Uh, he's still an asshole. There we go. In the butt. Excuse me if I can't say that, but he's still an asshole. So, so perfect. Not really. I like the guy he's talking about. Oh well, no, and 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 honestly, I, th I think I think I think honestly, I think Jeremy would I would have laughed at that more than anyone else. I wasn't talking about Jeremy. Oh, I, I wasn't. I thought we were talking about. Uh, I thought we were talking. I thought we were talking about McGowan. No, McGowan's oh, okay. his buddy. McGowan's oh, okay. his buddy. Yeah, no, he ain't talking about McGowan. He's talking about, uh, I believe, uh, little Davy Altman. Uh, who is a good guy. Yeah. Very good guy. It's a hard part for me, man, getting caught in the middle of stuff like that. Because I like Dave well, a lot. No. no, Dave, the truth of the matter is, man, is that what you got was the more realistic view of things. And that is oh, no. that there it's not black and white. It's never black and white. There's always reasons to support different people, right? I mean, it's like you you just you got to see the more realistic view of it because you got to see the, the balance of it. It just made it harder oh, on you, unfortunately. You no, know, it makes hard. It, it is hard. I mean, because I like Gary. I like Dave. And uh, yeah, totally. You know. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's hilarious in Canadian politics. One of our opposition leaders denounces the the uh, protest that's going on right now, mm -hmm. and his brother-in-law publicly <laughs> donated like thirteen thousand dollars to the cause. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome! Oh yeah, his brother-in-law. Yeah, Boy, Thanksgiving dinner is gonna be fun. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now, I mean, now, do you, do you have the same sort of thing up there that we have here? And, and unfortunately, it doesn't happen as much as it used to, because I, I actually think this is a good thing. Where, where basically you have you have members of each side who publicly are always at each other's throats, but privately, they they actually have a friendship and respect for each other. Oh yeah, they, that's they kind cool. of. Okay, so that's so that's still okay. So I, I I just assume that that goes on as well. The only time the only time they really brawl it out is what they call up here question period. That does sound vicious. Yeah. <laughs> question. Our time. parliament. You know how your parliament or your government building, your senate, it's all in like a semicircle. Ours, if you go uh, look at our parliament. It is, what do they, what, what's the measurement? I think it's like 15 feet between the aisles where the, the, the majority party is on one side and the opposition is on the other. And they had to make it that specific length because back in the day when it got really out of hand, 
they would draw swords on each other and there is you know the swords were like four feet long or something like that five feet long and they had to put room in between so that way they couldn't clang swords together and start a melee true story nice yeah. nice wow wow you know, ours is that half circle for TV. Yeah. It's better on TV that way. Yeah. One second here. Hey, it's gorgeous Gloria from Casual Conversation with GNA. You know the thing I, I will never forget, Dave, is is several years ago there was um I, I don't know if it was the World Cup or what what well, another World Cup, if it was the Stanley Cup or if it was um or what what I don't remember what but there was some hockey thing where basically uh uh like some Western Vancouver team like Vancouver's team lost and there was actually rioting in yeah. Canada and yeah. so just so, Vancouver so I went. I went there like a day or two afterwards for business. Yeah. And and I I, I grew up in California. <clears throat> 2011. So, like when we riot like buildings get burned to the ground. <laughs> And I go up to Canada and the only thing on film is that guy and girl laying on the street making out. <laughs> That was a nice film. Like, nobody got hurt. There was no violence on people. It was only things that got destroyed. I was like, oh man, they even riot like Canadians. <laughs> my uh, well it was the most polite riot I've ever seen. My buddy uh who owns the Vancouver Moose, one of our sponsors, my business partner, SOR, he had he had his windows shattered. Did he really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they, wow. They were I, but but the thing was, is it is it like, yeah, I don't I don't know. Like to me, like anytime anytime any of those things happen, and the only thing they go after is like stuff, it's a good day. Oh, I hear you. After people, it's a bigger problem. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm never that. I was like, man, I could not believe it. Like, I was expecting, like, I heard riots. I was expecting to, I was expecting to get to and see like buildings on fire and like, you know, like, like, you know, like. Oh, dude, that's that's not Vancouver. I know, I know, it's lovely. Yeah. All right, let's uh, check out on uh, the Namibia plane here. See what's happening. There we go. Nothing's happening yet. <laughs> Does it ever get exciting? Yeah, this this morning. <laughs> uh, oh, this is awesome. Uh, there was a, a, a big giant giraffe drinking out of here. Uh huh. And then there was a little bat-eared fox running around him. <coughs> A little while ago, there there were some obexes hanging out. If, if, if I was uh, if I was an animal there, I would die because I would walk up to that and I'd be like, "Yeah, right." Water what are you talking about? Middle of nowhere. It's like, like I would be so it's suspicious. Like eighty-four like, degrees. I would assume, it's like eighty-five degrees. I know, but like I would be so suspicious. I would assume that th that's a trick. That like they're trying to like 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 there's like some predator somewhere getting ready to take me out. Mm. Like that just looks suspicious. The biggest predator that they have here, because there's a list of animals that actually visit this watering hole, and the biggest predator they have here is it is cheetahs. Oh. Oh. Yeah, there's no lions, no tigers, no rhinoceroses okay. or hippopotamuses, no alligators or crocodiles. Wow. Kind of a nice place then. Yeah. But the problem is they have no elephants. And I like the elephants. I do. Elephants are are 
crazy creatures. Yeah. Crazy. Right by, right by this tree earlier today, there was like a pack of like five giraffe. Oh, wow. It was kind of cool. It was kind of cool. There, there have actually been cases of, of packs of elephants actually going to visit uh, people who have passed away and so forth. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. yeah. The cool elephants part about are... it is like when you go when you go like right across here and you see the animals coming in, you're like, what the what the hell is that? What the hell is that? It's a freeway. Then they get across like here and you're like, what the hell is that? Let's see. Uh, what's the chat room in here saying? Um, I don't know. They got some cool stuff here. <clears throat> it is beautiful, though. Yeah, I wouldn't drink from that hole. You, sure you would. You definitely want to boil it first or something. You definitely want to boil that. <laughs> I haven't been I haven't been to uh, Africa yet. I really I really would like to go. I almost had a chance, but it didn't end up working out. Mm. I've never been either. Yeah. I've actually personally I've actually, I've actually been to fourteen countries. I did get invited by uh, one of our local doctors. We have a lot of uh, doctors from Africa in my town. Oh yeah, I'm, yeah. My doctor's from like the Sudan. He's awesome. Really? Yeah, his wife actually ran for Miss Sudan back in the day. Huh. Yeah. She's what gorgeous. is it about your region that that attracts the is it Sud Sudanese? Is that the right way to say it? it? Well, actually, it's any doctor from Africa, uh, because what happens here is all of our university doctors when they graduate, mm -hmm. the majority of them get picked. Not the majority of them. Some of them <clears throat> get picked up by American hospitals because there's a doctor shortage down there, and your system is private, so they could get paid more, especially if they're specialty doctors, which leaves us short, which means that we pick up doctors from either the UK or Africa or the Middle East. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. And nurses so, too. So we we don't we don't just take the your oil. We take wow. Yeah. You know you guys are awful nice to us. Considering well, that's why we that's why we send you Canadian geese. <laughs> yeah. Mean little bastards they are. John Hudson is an island boy. Is it Wolf Boy? Uh huh. Figure that one out, John. You guys see Snoop Dogg's reaction to the Island Boy video when they're sitting in the hot tub? Oh, it's priceless. Just priceless. Did you see him um, uh, ho hosting the Olympics? Oh, yeah. That was... That was just like... I mean, I... I I don't think I've enjoyed the Olympics that much since the, like I can even remember like I that was so much fun that was so much fun he was awesome and that sweater with those glasses was freaking hilarious <clears throat> he's a big hockey fan too just so you know he's a funny dude all right hold on one second here buddy Mm -hmm. 
in the sticks this time. <clears throat> Nothing in there yet. Hold on. Let's widen that. <clears throat> What's going on here? Oh, it's doing that stupid thing. It should fail here any moment. <laughs> or this thing just is drunk and can't count. Oh, it's going to stall out here momentarily. We go like that, guaranteed. Low Pro, what's going on, man? Hey, Sovereign Farts, you're a little late. Were you ripping up the bathroom or what? Need to get new paint for the walls? <clears throat> Nightmare, good night. Oh, there is no giraffe here yet. I'm looking for him. <laughs> I think this thing here, right here, I think that's a salt lick. <clears throat> okay, see, now I'd be really suspicious. I think salt licks do not appear naturally. Obviously, someone has set this up. No, no of course. I would well, be so paranoid, I would came, die. Where do you think the camera came from? Oh, I know that, but my point is, is that, you know, if I was an animal, I'd be like, oh, God, I should have sketchy. played. Hold on. Let's go back here. See what's up. There we go. No, we're playing now. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing. There does seem to be something moving way over here in the shade of that tree. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Gotta admit, though, the whole idea of just setting up cameras in all sorts of different locations in remote regions of Africa is a smart, smart thing to do. Oh, yeah. There, there's plenty of them. It's actually really cool. We were going through this last night. <clears throat> let's go to the live set here. Well, let's check out the Africam video here. Look at that. There's a beautiful giraffe. Check that out. Oh, yeah. Wow. What you pretty, doing? Thin, pretty thin giraffe. Well, that's a bone there. They're always thin, I guess not. Yeah, actually, he doesn't look so good. He's quite thin. Watch him drop a big deuce right here. Pull the sovereign farts and just let it go. <clears throat> Yeah. Well, that camera's getting shaky. Maybe something's nudging it. Well, there's a zebra. There's a zebra right there, man. What the hell is this? That's another zebra. No, it's not. Is that a zebra over there, too? That's a zebra. Hold on. Let's zoom in. That looks like some sort of warthog or something. That's a zebra. Or is that a baby zebra? I don't know. I don't know. That yeah, that's definitely a zebra there. Oh, that is a warthog. Look at that. It was a warthog. We're in some action here. Come on, poop on the zebra. I wonder what they're talking about. Huh? 
I said, I wonder what they're talking about. Are you high? No, dude. Look, animals communicate. <clears throat> what are they? Hey, Fred, what do you think of that? That that warthog over there. It's got some mighty oh, tucks. Well, tusks there, Jim. Oh, there's a GNU. There's a GNU. Obviously. No, but they, they send roads just like just like you do when you're out of your body. You, you send these like thought form packages of like uh, images and and colors and and sounds and and it's ideas and like you know these thought forms. There's three of them. This is a lion's paradise. Look at that. You got you got the warthogs, whatever the hell that thing is with the antlers. You got know those zebras, as the Brits call them, zebras. Do they the really giant call them zebras? Which is Mexic. Zebras? Yeah. Huh. It's zebras. I I I am with you on that one. Right, let's see. Let's see what else we got here. Okay, this one's getting boring. Oh, let's go live here. Where'd my live go? Where'd my live button go? Gosh, I hate it when this happens. Live. Oh, so while let's I'm go. learning about isotopes, you're watching these. That's cool. Oh, this looks it's kind very of cool. relaxing. What? Oh, that looks very comfy there. You know right then and there that the minute you take a step in to take a sip, you're a dead man in this pool. <clears throat> Why is that? Probably crocodiles. Oh. We can talk UFOs, guys. I'm waiting for some questions. Well, I Ask don't think questions. the zebra have any questions, Dave. Zebras. Zebras. That's a weird one, Zebra. Hold on. That's right, Ozzy Ange. It's Zebra. The mother corp and the mothership still calls it Zebra at tea time. <laughs> Question, is a zebra a white horse with black stripes or a black horse with white stripes? Good question. Hey, Phil Minervino, how are you, buddy? Good to see you. There's nothing happening here. Nothing. Where else? Be careful, Dave. They, they might be able to sense your disappointment through the camera. Last night, there was a giant, or earlier today, there was a giant jaguar walking along here. Really? That was, yeah, that was really cool. Um, I think it's a white horse with black stripes. Amber, do you think aliens can cloak themselves to blend in with surroundings? 100% yes. 100% yes. Um... I think oh, let me let me expand on that for a second. I think that they have the ability to be invisible and just morph with energy and, and communicate with energy. <clears throat> That's what I learned from Samantha Mowat years ago. Uh gorgeous glory, I think we've got 20 23 or 24 confirmed. Look at this. Look. <gasps> Ooh, Holy check cow. that out. Look at the That's size. Awesome. That's what we wanted to see right there. <clears throat> right on. Yeah. What, what are we going to name him? <clears throat> uh, we're doing everything, but we're watching these live African cameras because I'm, I'm enthralled with them. Uh, Larry A., he wasn't sure. How many UFOs do you think they see? <clears throat> oh, gosh. I don't even know. And so so here's the question. So so if you if you 
and 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 I I tend to be in this camp myself. So so I'll, I'll admit to that. So if you if you if you believe that there is a element of yourself that goes into every perception, that that basically it is possible for like you myself and say like you know Gemma to be standing next to each other, uh, for a craft to appear in the sky and for me to see it. And you two to be looking at the exact same spot and not yep. see it. Okay, so if yep. if you assume that that's true, and if you assume that that's possible, then that would indicate that animals never ever see them. No, not unless the craft has asked them or said they're not going to show them. Look, when I had my Bigfoot encounter where I saw the pixelation, out of the four of us in the group, two of us saw the pixelation, two did not. <clears throat> um, no, Phil, I don't think he does. Look at that, three of them now. It's a party. Four. Four of them. So I'm taking it the first one was like the new guy and he had to test the water. And once they saw that he hadn't died, then the rest of them were like, all right, cool. Pretty much. It's safe. Pretty much. He's the food taster. Do elephants ever get abducted? Can I think you imagine so. Imagine the size. Wow. How big of a bay would you need? Um, uh, Gloria, are you coming? Are you going to confirm here soon? Uh, John does not know how to pronounce Z in Canada. Well, I have some idea. I'm half Canadian. Well, I know that, but I still don't believe that you know how to pronounce Z. Well, Z, Z. What is Z, John? Z. Maybe you do. Maybe he does know, Phil. Did Gloria respond yet? Hey there, Gong Show. <clears throat> the reason why I put this on is just to chill out and relax a little bit, guys. River Dogma, what's happening? If you crawl into your own ass, do you disappear? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Sovereign Farts, if you want to see animals go missing, come here in the summertime. It's hilarious. <laughs> how many people how many people post on on street signs and billboards that their cats went missing. My area is not a safe place for cats to go to go outside. It's amazing how many people forget that. <coughs> Crack me up. Mm-hmm. Put a camera on one and see what happens. Gloria, did you respond? Oh, oh, you're trying to make it happen still. Gloria's trying to make her way to Vegas with her mom. We're going to be partying with Gloria and Gloria's mom. So the entire weekend, if she makes it, I'm going to be like, hi, Gloria's mom. How are you? She's going to be like, no, no, my name is so-and-so. And I'm going to be, okay, thanks, Gloria's mom. <laughs> I Actually, I, I like the fact that, like, at the park, you know, when I go to park with, with, with my daughter, like, and other kids come up and talk to me, that my, my official name is Scarlet's dad. Like that's that is kind of cool. Scarlet's dad. <laughs> Crank me up. Mm -hmm. I like the elephants, man. I do too. They got the camera too close, though. So. Wicked smart creatures. Oh yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm.
You ever ridden an elephant? No. I have. No, I haven't. You know, you know a sad thing? Oh, that one just I... dropped a deuce right there, right in the water. Look at that. Right there. Replay. Let's get the instant replay here. I, I've never even been well, on there a There it horse. is. This guy, John. I mean, there it is, taking a piss. And there it comes. Oh, the cans of Campbell's soup just falling right out. You disgusting elephant. People are trying to... Look at that. People are trying to drink in there. Here you are, shitting and pissing in the hole. It's recycling. Absolutely classless. Classless. Who are you? Where do you come from? What do you want to do with your life? See, I can't watch this now. True. Look at this one. Oh, well, let's have a little sniff here. Wonder what happened here. Oh, Johnny, did you shit in the pool again? Did you piss and shit in the pool? Come on. I think it was considered polite, honestly. This one can't figure it out. He's like, I'm trying to walk by, but you went and dookied right here in front of me. I'll guarantee you steps in it because he's a dirty bastard that way. Well, he's made it first point. You're a strange man, Dave. Oh, he missed it. He didn't even step in it. Look at that. I thought he would, but he's still in the piss-filled water. Honestly, that's the least of your concerns in that water. <laughs> <laughs> there are all sorts of things trying to climb into holes and oof. bad, 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 bad mojo. Look at this guy. Now he's going to go step in his own poop here. See? Step right in his own poop. Yeah. He doesn't he care. Can. River Dogma, are you going? And uh, have you uh, hit up the um, uh, the info at spacedoutradio.com? Have you done that yet? Oh, number four, eh? Now oh. yeah, look at him. He's like, I'm, I'm going to drink over here now after I shit and pissed over here. Well, he's not stupid. Gloria, if your parents believe Vegas is Sodom and Gomorrah, how are you getting your mother up to Vegas? Is your mother ready to sin? All right. I can't stare at that poop anymore. That's just blinding me. All right. Where else are we going? I'm um, back to uh, anorexic uh, anorexic giraffe guy. Oh, no. Uh, let's check out what's happening in Namibia here. See if. Oh, look. Look at all the good. What is, uh, these are the. Yeah, what are these? These are the Obexes, I believe. Yeah, those are all the Obexes. That's the most I've seen. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's the most I've seen. These guys got some wicked ass horns, man. Wicked ass horns. Like they are ready to brawl. Really? Oh yeah. Guaranteed these guys over here sneak over for a little drink of water because they're gonna screw over their friends. That's where it goes sometimes. Uh, cutoff day uh, for all is slow, peeps, for Vegas. Uh, the cutoff date for Vegas will be, I need to know, by March 20th. 
I need to know my March went. I, I mean, that doesn't mean you can't come. Oh, I see what they're doing. They built a line of the males up here so all the females and youngins can come in and drink. That's what they've oh, done. That's, that's a security perimeter there. Just to make sure, like, like OJ doesn't get in there and, you know, if the shoe, if the yep. if glove fit, you must have quit, right? Yeah. Look at the size of this guy here. I mean, he looks like he could, he could, you know, really, really do some damage. He looks strong. Uh, see all the babies coming in here? Look how cute that mm -hmm. is. Um, so, yeah, uh, for Vegas, I need to, if you're going to get a swag bag, I need to know by March 20th. And then if you're if you're coming, but you're not sure you're coming, and and all this kind of stuff, um, then I, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <sighs> Look at all these salty pigs here. Well, move on over there, Henry. I want a little swig. It's like happy hour. Right after work. Tequila is only three bucks a shot here. No, these are called Obexes. O-B-E-X. Like, seriously, look at the size of this guy here. <laughs> he is massive. Massive. Yeah. You imagine hopping on his back with some spurs on your shoes and just holding on to them antlers and say, let's go. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, it, mm. Oh, oh. I'm so, thinking so, that would be considered rude. Something just spooked them. It's probably what you said. Well, I don't think they heard us. You notice how polite these animals are here, too? Not shitting in the water. Not, you know. Nobody's that fat kid who, sit, who poops in the water at the local swimming pool. Well, maybe when you weigh as much as an elephant does and no one can really tell you what to do, you do what you want. Now, see, this one's on the salt lick right here, see? It is kind of cool. Hey, Gong Show has his birthday tomorrow. The big 26. What kind of calisthenics are you going to be doing tomorrow for your birthday? Do you ever play Doom? The game Doom, Dave? Doom? Yeah, I did the original one on the Nintendo. That was okay. horrible graphics. Yep. And to kill that big brain thing. Yep. Yeah, I also used to play the original Diablo and Diablo Two. <gasps> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, Dave, Dave, yeah, you, you have no idea how much that means to me, Dave. Uh, yeah. No, Di Diablo was one, one was one of my favorite games, and uh, and I, I actually I, I actually used to work at a uh, an online gaming company where we actually ran that game online. I used to uh, let's see, because uh, Diablo two took forever to come out, or was it Diablo three that took Diablo forever? Diablo three to took forever. Okay, so Diablo two, I actually had my warrior. Uh, I had a barbarian, and I had him up to, oh, goodness. He wasn't high, but I built him up to, like, 1,200, 1,400. Nice. With his gear and everything. I was pretty happy about him. That's cool. Uh-huh. I can't play games today, though. My eyes are too weak. Oh. I I play my wolf game. That's about it. Okay. It's the only game I play. All right. Old Davey's got to go to bed because he's got to get up with his kid in the morning. So hockey. what we're going to do. No hockey is tonight. School tomorrow. 
So how, what we're how, going to how, do? How early do you have to get up for school? Uh, I get up about seven oh five with him. <gasps> okay, sorry. Go ahead. What time do you get up? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I don't have a job right now, Dave. So I basically just wake up whenever I feel like it. You are you are a complete slaughter song. Up all night, sleep all day. Basically, yeah. Uh huh. But I've always been that way. I mean, when I, when I was a kid, like basically as soon as Saturday came, I was out cold till at least noon, oh. if not one or two. Me too, man. I always thought it was the coolest thing if you could sleep in to like one, two o'clock in the afternoon. <sighs> I say a big thank you to Cat Chaser, Smithy, Simon Times one, Michael Times mm -hmm. two, Dry Toast, Magician, Murray, and Mark for the amazing super chats. Tomorrow night on the show, who do we got? Uh, okay, that changed. I forget who my guest is tomorrow. Hold on. I got to go to the website. Fastoutradio.com. Uh, uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Carter Bouchard is our guest. Carter Bouchard. We're going into the forest. We got Bigfoot talk. He's got a new book out. That's <laughs> what we're going to do. Cool. I apologize for the instant yawns here, boys and girls, but gosh darn it. After that elephant pooped in the water, I just don't have an appetite to do anything else but sleep right now. So this is literally what's going to happen. Yeah. We're going to get actually, Phil. Phil, real quick, uh, when I travel, I sleep in my fedora all the time. Like in airports, parks, anywhere I can catch a nap, I just fedora over my face. Poop gone, out cold. One of my favorite things to do. Good night, John. Have a good evening, sir. <laughs> 